p.m. So I think we want to make a start. Welcome to the July meeting of the Planning Committee. Welcome to those joining us online. Uh, so first of all, any apologies? Councillor McGuire. Hi, uh, Gormay. Glenn, thanks, Glenn. Uh, an apology from uh, Councillor Sean Donnelly. Uh, Councillor Feely's running a bit late. He'll be here in about five minutes, he says. Okay, Councillor Garrett. Thank you very much, Chair. And just like uh, Tommy said, their Councillor um, John Coyle's running a bit late in traffic. He'll be here shortly. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, Item two, members, is to um, sign the minutes uh, of the previous meeting held on the 16th of June 2021. And that has been sorted. And item three, has any declarations of interest? Councillor Dehan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, item seven, planning decisions. Kelly Clauher, GAA, as a member of Cardi Kappa. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, item seven, as a member of Mount Joy Presbyterian Church. Thank you. And Councillor McLaughery. Uh, thank you. It's uh, item six, uh, application number two. I spoke on their behalf before I became part member of the planning committee. Okay, thank you, Councillor. And I also want to declare an interest in item seven, um, that's application LA10 2021-0280, and that's a, a relation, a relative is the applicant. Okay. Matters arising then from the minutes, um, we'll just go through them page by page. So page one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Can I have a proposer for the minutes? Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Irving. Yes, Councillor Deacon. My apologies, Chair. I'm just noticing uh, another item uh, where I need to declare an interest, a seven point note. Uh, applicant LA10 2021-0327F is a relative. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, so item 4.1 is to receive an update report on the holding direction correspondence from Department for Infrastructure and Planning Application LA10 2019-1392F, and that's paper A. And I'm going to ask our Head of Planning, Sinead, to um, take us through that. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, members, paper A. One, um, this is a report for noting um, in relation to the holding direction issued to us by the Department for Infrastructure on the 24th of June um, in relation to the Uniport planning application. Um, the holding direction is attached to the Appendix 1 of the report. Um, and it states the Council may not grant planning permission for this development until further advised by the Department. Um, the correspondence explains that the Department has issued the direction to allow time to consider whether or not the proposal raises issues that require the application to be referred to it for further consideration and determination. Um, the Planning Act does give the Department the power to call in an application, and if that were to occur, then the Department would become responsible for determining the application. Um, it is important to note at this stage that the application has not been called in, but rather this is a holding direction um, to allow the department time to consider whether it should be referred to it for determination. If the department determines that an application should be called in, 
then they would write to us and all and any correspondence in that we would receive from the department in that regard then would be made available um, on the public portal um, and everyone would have, have sight of that. So the recommendation um, is that Council notes the report in respect of the attached holding direction um, correspondence from the department. Councillor McGuire. Uh, Gorham, uh, uh, Glenn, happy enough to, to propose the noting of the, the correspondence, but if I could just add uh, a disappointment at the timing of the, uh, the, the, the order, as in that application was with us for quite a considerable length of time, and uh, the department would have had the time prior to the decision even being made, but uh, taking it in at that stage, that's just the one consideration that I have. But other than that, happy to note the correspondence. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Garrity. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I will second the note and open. Thank you. Okay. okay, members. So, item five then is to consider three files for a decision by the planning committee. Committee, sorry, and that's paper B. I'll hand you over to Darren to take us through that. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. I'll go through the applications. Um, uh, there's uh, three files just I would like to uh, raise with you. So, Paper C, Application 3, LA 10 2020 1273, is the full application for the horticultural shed. Uh, just to advise members, an email of support was received on the 19th of July and two letters of objection were received on the 15th of July and the 20th of July. There's been no reconsultation uh, with neighbours in relation to the supporting letter, uh, and there's been no reconsultation with roads. Uh, in relation to any of the correspondence that was received. Um, members, the uh, officer's view would be that that would need to be carried out uh, prior to any decision being made on the application, uh, and therefore we would request members agree to a deferral uh, to allow that all to be carried out and the application then brought back to the September meeting. Okay, Councillor Irving. Uh, I'm happy enough uh, to propose uh, what Darren said that we defer uh, back to the officers and they can bring it back and they'll put no time limit on it. It just depends how long the consultations are going to take. Thank you. Thanks, Sir Robinson. I just second that. Uh, so in relation to two other applications then on paper C, uh, application seven, uh, LA 10 uh, for Donnelly and uh, paper C application eight, LA 10 f for Armstrong. Uh, on the outline application for Mr. Donnelly, 645, amended plans have been received uh, relating to the roads and the access uh, provisions. Uh, those need to be re advertised. They were notified again, a uh, re consultation with roads take, uh, take place. So, uh, again, that would be a request to defer that uh, to allow that to happen and brought back to September. There's also been a request in relation to application 7 and 8 by the agent. Uh, and supported by Councillor McCann uh, for a deferral as the agent is on holidays uh, and is unable to attend the meeting today. So officer's view would be application seven uh, needs to be deferred to allow the roads issues to be further explored. In relation to application eight, LA 10 f Armstrong, uh, there's no reason why the application couldn't go forward and be determined at this meeting, uh, as I say, other than the agent has requested the deferral because he's on holidays. Okay, members, Councillor uh, Irving. Uh, just to clarify uh, from Darren, uh, the first one under um, item 5.1, are you, are you looking for a deferral on that? Sorry, which ones are the application? Which ones are you looking for? So the, the paper C, application 7, Donnelly, yep. is the one that the amended plans have come in. Um, right. There needs to be a reconsultation with the roads. And also Happy to do that. Uh, irrespective of the other one, I think, um, look, if you're going on holidays, you know you're going on holidays and you should appoint a substitute. We've had this before. Um, so I'm happy to recommend that we um, defer application seven, but I'm not going to include application eight. Sorry, Kim, did you want in at this point, Kim? Check note that in terms of the, the planning committee protocol, application eight has already been deferred on two occasions. And the protocol does note that deferral should be rare, and that the committee will generally defer an application only once. Uh, just noted. Okay, Councillor Dehan. Well, thank you. I'd uh, like to second Councillor Irvine's proposal uh, to defer application number seven. Um, 
uh, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I would. I appreciate the point that Kim has made and Robert as well, Chair. Um, but you know, in 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 making a decision on the planning applications, I, I generally find it so helpful to have the agent there and to be able to ask questions and ask for clarification. And um, I know, I know, it 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 it, it is an unfortunate set of circumstances, but um, you know, I would be proposing that we should defer application number eight for the reasons I've stated, Chair. Thank you. Okay, members. <clears throat> so we have a proposal seconded to defer application number seven and a proposal to proceed with application eight and another proposal to uh, defer application eight. Neither have been seconded at this point. Councillor McLaughlin. Sorry, there's two proposals that neither of them have been seconded. We need somebody to second to go ahead with number eight. Yes, we, we, we can. Um, there's two proposals on the table. One is opposite of the other, effectively. One is to go ahead and the other is to defer. If, if, if Roberts needs proposed to go ahead, I'll, I'll propose to go ahead. But number eight, you second that. Councillor Irvine's proposal. Councillor Rainey. Second. Councillor Dr. Deacon's proposal that we do give the applicant the benefit of the doubt. Well, okay. So we have two proposals then, consider both seconded. Councillor Garrity. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And just um, to, for clarity, Kim, this has been deferred twice already, hasn't it? Yes, it's yeah. been deferred. Uh, well, just I think it's important to note that when Rathis goes to the vote, because it is regrettable, and I do, like Hunter Dehan, think that it's very advantageous to have the agent here. But uh, you know, on a third occasion, I think we are really you know, maybe letting it slip a little. So we have to be mindful of our duty on the plan committee and getting work done, as regrettable as it may be. Thank you, Chair. Hey, Councillor. So I'm going to put to a vote then um, Councillor Irvine's proposal to proceed with the application. Eight, seconded by Councillor McLaughlin. So if all are in favour, um, raise their hands. Just keep your hands up while you record those. Okay, and all those against, and okay, that's three. So in that case, we would proceed with um, determining application number eight, and we don't need to consider the other proposal. Yes, that has been proposed and seconded. Um, are we all in agreement with that? We are. Thank you for that, members. Chair, Chair, am I in contact with you? Because if not, I might have to go to UMA to get an office. Uh, I hear you loud and clear, uh, Councillor Wilson. Thank you. That's fine. OK. Um, just, uh, we're just going to summarise the decisions there. Yeah, so members, just uh, in relation to the, the three applications referred to, so paper three, application three, LA 10 2020 1273, the full application for the horticultural shed is deferred uh, to be brought back uh, at a, another meeting and no date was specified. In relation to paper C, application seven, LA 10 2020 06450 for Mr. Donnelly, uh, again, that application was deferred uh, to be brought back uh, at another date and uh, no date specified. Um, paper C, then application 8, LA 10 2020-0743F for Armstrong, uh, was not deferred and will be determined at this meeting. 
Okay, thank you, Darren. So returning then to item five, and that's to consider three files for decision, paper B. First applications. Okay, work. Okay, members. So uh, application uh, number one is uh, LA10 2020 It's a full application for a single story rear extension to a dwelling with an access ramp and fence to the front uh, for Ms. Midlone at uh, Daly Park in Balik. And the recommendation then is to grant full planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to one condition. So on the screen then, members, you can see the details of the application. So the site location plan then uh, is number 25, uh, Daly Park, and it's identified by the red rectangle. Uh, within the, the existing housing development and that's just a better plan I'm showing a location you can see it's in, it's the second property in in the terrace of four uh, so just the existing floor plan then um, the drawing has been turned around 90 degrees members just to allow easy reference uh, better uh, presentation purposes so if we start on the right uh, is the front garden it's the green rectangle and then you have the path and it's coming into the house and the existing house then is in red and there's a kitchen at the rear and living room at the front with a hall and the access doorway. And out the rear, then, it's the yard and small garden area. So the proposed plans then uh, show on the right-hand side a new ramp uh, to be created to allow uh, access into the front door. You come into the hall, then there'll be a bedroom on the right-hand side at the front of the property created. And then an extension out the rear, which is the red, uh, outlined red uh, area. And that'll create a new extended kitchen and new living dining area. And there'll also be then a decking area at the rear. There'll be other internal readjustments uh, to create a shower room and a uh, bathroom on the ground floor. Full side elevation then. So if we're looking at the side of the house, this is the extension out to the left with the extension in in red. And you can see the uh, it comes out from the property. There's a slight difference in levels, but nothing significant. And then the decking area at the rear. The proposed elevations in the front, no real change other than you will have the new uh, ramp at the front of the property, uh, which will remove the garden area, but that will not have any uh, real um, adverse impact on the character of the area. Uh, the existing fence will be retained or repaired and put back in condition, similar to what's there at the moment. And the rear elevation then, you can see it's a mono-pitched roof uh, coming out from the existing property with the double doors at the back. Members, the recommendation then is to approve planning permission. Uh, for the reasons listed within the report and subject to one condition. Okay, and um, Councillor, Councillor Feely? Yeah, yeah, I, I propose that. And Councillor Coy? Thank you, Chair. No, I've uh, read the search report and I'm happy to second uh, the approval of this plan and application. Okay, so the recommendation has been proposed and seconded. Are we all in agreement? Members, so the recommendation then was to approve planning permission. Members have granted planning permission uh, subject to the condition within the report. Okay, so application two then is LA10 2021 LBC, and that's to repair stabilization to four spine wall, stabilization to the base of two large chimneys. And general window and door head stabilization due to rotting of timber head support. And the recommendation here is to approve. I'll ask Darren to take us through it. Yeah. So, application LA10 2021 0682 uh, LBC. So, it's a listed building consent application uh, for the repairs or stabilization to the four spine walls, stabilization to the base of the two large chimneys, and general window and door head stabilization uh, as a result of the rotting of the timber head supports. The applicant is the council, uh, and the location then is Nicarran Castle in Irvinstown. And the recommendation then is to approve, is to grant consent for the reasons this was in the report and subject to the three conditions. So on the screen then, members, I'm sure you know the castle well. Um, the, uh, the site then is uh, shown on the screen within the red line. Um, there will be a small site hut uh, placed beside the building, uh, and then a fence go around that uh, with a uh, pedestrian access on one side and then gates in the front uh, to allow uh, larger vehicles to get in. Internally then, uh, you'll note from the report members the, com the comments about the condition of the building. Um, so this is a, a drawing showing the, the proposed works that will be carried out. Uh, I've numbered them one to four there. Uh, it's actually two, three for some reason, but number if we start at number one, structural movement uh, above the window in the chapel. So that'll be repaired and made good. 
You can see then the number two, the collapsed door head to the courtyard. Again, the works there to make it good. Number three then in the top right, uh, undercut the masonry at the base of the chimney requiring urgent support. And if you follow the arrow down, you can see the two rectangles that are dashed in, this, uh, in there in the center of the building, and they require urgent support. And then it should be number four at the bottom left, four principal areas of concern in relation to masonry cross wall stability requiring urgent temporary support and bracing. And that relates to the two areas at the front of the property showing with the red rectangles. So the uh, application does include further information on this uh, and on the proposed works. And on the screen, you can see the uh, photograph taken looking down on the property. And the two walls in are identified that are, are currently uh, uh, of concern. And the system of temporary bracing within the stairwell is proposed for the two brick cross walls that enclose the original stairwell. And there are voids in the wall head of the chimneys as well. And these will be pinned to stabilize the structure. And another photograph then showing the walls that divide the drawing room, hall and dining room which have significant openings at ground level, leaving the upper masonry in a precarious condition. And temporary support will be uh, provided at ground level uh, to retain these and support them. Uh, and then again, as with all listed building consent applications, there may be not as many drawings as a planning application, but there's a lot of detail to go with those. Uh, this report then is a snip taken out of those reports, and uh, it sets out the issues in relation to the window heads, uh, as an example here in the wall tops and door heads, etc. So you can see the issue on the left hand side that uh, the conservation approach then is in the centre, uh, and then the rationale for the works is on the right hand side. And that goes through the various works that will be carried out, and you can see the window heads in 3.03, the door heads in 3.04, the wall tops in 3.05, and then the ironwork in 3.06. So uh, for the reasons listed within the report members, the recommendation then is to grant consent for the uh, repairs and stabilisation works uh, subject to the three conditions. Councillor McClaughery. Yes, thank you, Chair. Obviously, this has been long, long awaited by the community and uh, to see this uh, building work going on is, is brilliant. And I'd be quite happy to, with the conditions above, to propose that we go with the recommendation. Councillor Irving. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. I'm happy to second the proposal by Councillor McCluckery to go with his officer's recommendation to approve. Thank you. Okay. And Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm happy to support uh, Councillor McCluckery and Councillor Irving on their proposal with the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Coyle. Thanks, Chair. Uh, no, fully support um, the approval of this. Um, it'll be uh, Good for to keep uh, the building in good shape, and the uh, uh, recommendations is, um, you know, safeguarding uh, and using materials that is uh, has been in, uh, used in the past. So I welcome that. Thank you. Okay, members. So the recommendations being proposed and seconded. Are we all in agreement? Thank you. And application three LA ten. 2021-0497-F, that's the side and rear extension to dwelling, including the garden room. Yeah, so application three then, members, is LA10-2021-0497, it's a full application for a side and rear extension to a dwelling, including the garden room, and it's for Damien e and Emer Ferguson of number 61 Scaffold Avenue, Sligo Road, in Eskillen. The recommendation is to grant full planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to one condition. On the screen, members, is the site location plan uh, with the site identified in red. This is just a better aerial photograph uh, showing the location of the building and the ordnance survey map. And so you can see it's a large detached house with a, a large garden area at the rear. And you can also note them members of proximity to the other houses. So the block plan then shows the location of the building in relation to other houses and the plot and also then the orientation of the sun. The extension then is to the west of the, the rear of the building which is out to the west and the garden room then is in the top left corner. I'll we'll do that in a second. So the proposed plans then show an extension out to the rear of the building to create an extended uh, living and dining and sitting area with the utility as well on the ground floor. 
And then on the first floor, you can see the extension then to the side above the garage for the master bedroom and dressing room. And again, then just the front elevations uh, of the proposal. So top left now will be the new elevation, so the extensions over the garage. The top right then is the side view, looking in towards the new extended garage. Bottom left then is the rear elevation, which shows the extension coming out from the property. And then the bottom right is the extension uh, from the side. You'll also note then there's a window on the cable uh, proposed, and that's to be frosted glass. The garden room then is uh, 2.7 metres in height. And uh, the details then are shown on the screen. So the recommendation then, members, is to grant full planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to one condition. Jake, Councillor Thompson. Thank you again, Chairman. I'm happy to propose uh, the officer's recommendation to approve with the one condition as listed. Thank you. Councillor McGuire. I go my good plan. Yeah, I'd. Happy enough to second the recommendation. Okay, we're all in agreement, members. Okay. Starting to sum up there. Just yeah. Oh, sorry. So the recommendation then was to grant full planning permission for the reasons listed within the report, and members have granted permission uh, subject to the condition uh, within the report. Thank you. Um, so item six then is to consider it. Delegated files called in for decision by the planning committee. That's paper C for your information. Application one uh, has already been deferred. So application two uh, is LA 10 2020 0171A. And that's three shop signs, four billboard signs, and a proposed totem sign. Oh, sorry. Sorry, application one is not. My apologies. Sorry. Uh, an annotation error in my notes here. So application one, LA 10, 2021 0098F, and that's the retention of a ret retaining wall. Oh, yeah. No, it's fair. It's fair. My apologies. I don't know. Um, Okay, my apologies, Councillor McClahery. So we're proceeding with application one, LA 10, 2021, 0098F. Okay, members, so uh, application number one, LA 10, 2021, 0098F. Uh, it's a full application for the retention of a retaining wall uh, to the rear of a property and the removal of a fence, uh, a new timber fence to the rear of the retaining wall, and alteration of existing ground level and landscaping to the rear to enhance amenity. The applicant then is Ms. Quinn, and the location then is 27 Glenan Park, Kelly Clarhan, Oma. The recommendation then is to approve planning permission for the reasons listed within the report. Uh, just before I go through the presentation, members, uh, just to give you an update on what's noted in the report, the application was presented to the committee in June uh, with a recommendation to refuse. However, amended plans have been received uh, prior to the uh, council meeting, and the committee deferred the application to allow the uh, reconsideration of those plans and also public reconsultation to take place. Following this, the recommendation by officers has changed from a refusal to an approval subject to the conditions. And uh, there's also been then a letter of objection received from number 73, and I'll show their property on the screen. That letter of objection continues to object to the plans and the development, uh, and it states the uh, this is a dangerous structure and the health and safety is of the utmost importance and must be adhered to. Uh, they have referred to their previous comments of objection uh, and would ask that the application is refused. In terms of the details then, members, on the screen you can see the application site in red. Uh, it's identified with a red outline. And then you can see then on the, the Ordnance Survey map, so the location of the property then within the, the park and also the proximity to other neighbours then nearby. And you can see there's quite a few houses to the rear. There is also a difference in levels uh, to the rear, and I'll come on to that in a second. So the existing plans then um, are on the screen, and they show the existing concrete retaining wall, which has been erected along the back of the property. 
It's an L shape. You can see it on the screen there. It rises in height from 1.2 at the top to 2.4 meters at the bottom. So if you imagine members and you're standing at the side at the blue star and you're looking towards the side of the property. So you can see number 27 on the left and number 73, the objectors property on the right. So if we're looking at a side profile view, that's what you would see at the, at the moment. You can see number 27 on the left and then number 73 on the right. The difference in levels then uh, between the two is shown on the screen and I'll come on to that again in a second with more detail. So at the moment the number 27 has the uh, retaining wall which has been constructed about 10 and a half meters out from their rear boundary. Um, there is a gap then to the site boundary um, so all the works are within the applicant's control and then there is a gap to the common boundary to number 73. You can see then on top of the retaining wall a close boarded fence has been erected which is 2.4 meters in height and that is affixed to the retaining wall. So if you imagine then members were at the objectors property number 73 at the blue star looking towards the elevation of the retaining wall and that's the existing plans that have been sent in so on the bottom left drawing you can see the wall is about 18.3 meters in length uh, facing towards the neighbor on the left hand side it's measuring 2.4 meters in height and it narrows down to the right hand side to around 1.2 meters in height on top of that wall there is then an existing 2.4 meter high close boarded timber fence and that is I say 2.4 meters in height your top right photograph then shows a photograph uh, taken by the third party or taken uh, of the existing works so that shows the retaining wall and the fence that is, that is on site at the moment so if we just go through then and say that's the existing works the proposed plans then uh, now show an amendment to what is on the ground the retaining wall will remain so it's going to stay at the blue line in the center of the screen the red line then is a new 2.4 meter high close boarded timber fence which will be placed in front of the retaining wall uh, and you can see from the annotation on the screen from the applicant it's there to screen the concrete retaining wall. The green line then is a new 1.8 meter high close boarded timber fence and that will be sited in the applicant's garden. Again members if we're standing at the blue, blue star looking towards the side of the two properties that's the cross section through between the two properties. So you can see number 27 on the left and number 73 on the right. And I'll just take you through the five details here, uh, the five elements. So number 27, it's at a level of around 100. And number 73 is at a level of 97.3 or 97.6 for the finished floor level of number 73. The first element is a reduction of the ground levels of number 27 by 0.43. So at the moment the garden is fairly flat. It'll be lowered then by around half a meter. Part two then is a new 1.8 meter high close boarded fence. You can see that on the screen. There then is a landscape bank uh, at an angle of one and two, which will remove the soil which is pressing up against the retaining wall at present. And there's only part of the retaining wall, wall then will be supporting any of the soil. Uh, that will be landscaped as per part three. Part four then is to retain the retaining wall and part five then is the new screen fencing in front of the retaining wall. So again, members, just to refer to the levels, you can see the difference between the two properties and that number 27 is at 100 and number 73 is at a lower level of 97.6 for their finished floor level. So from the rear elevation then, so if, again, just go back to this. So if we're standing at number 73 at their back door looking towards the works now, this is what you will see in the, in the proposed plans. So the fence on top of the retaining wall will be removed and it'll be replaced by a new 1.8 meter high close boarded timber fence, which will be set back from the retaining wall. So there'll be a break then along the line of the blue line on the screen, and that splits the, the works. Obviously the impact on the neighbors uh, is an important consideration, uh, and especially upon number 73, and they have objected to the application and raised a number of issues, and those are all considered within the report. If we just look at the top right drawing then shows the orientation of the sun. So number 73's garden faces west and the application site number 27 faces east. So in relation to overshadowing, the sun would rise in the east and then set in the west. So in the evening time, there is a possibility of overshadowing of the garden uh, from the development in number 27. 
In terms of the differences and separation distances, those are in the top left drawing. So number 73 is orientated slightly away from number 27. At its closest, it's around 7.4 metres, and that extends out an angle to around 12 metres. And uh, then number 27 will have a back garden area of about 6.8 metres. And you can see that then in the bottom slide, the difference in levels, uh, which are important, and then the um, separation distance from the walls to the adjacent properties. Well, so members, the recommendation then is to approve planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the three conditions. And members will note one of the conditions is that the existing fence on top of the retaining wall is removed, uh, which is what the application is proposing. And then the new screen fencing will be erected and replaced then along the front. And also then a landscaping plan will be submitted for consideration and agreement for the landscape bank area. Thanks very much, Chair. Just a couple of questions for Darren. Um, because the actual uh, concrete or reinforced concrete or brick retaining wall hasn't been removed, has any structural or have any structural calculations been provided and checked over with regard to the stability of same? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Two, because there is a difference in level from 27 to 73, the issue of transfer of groundwater may or may not be an issue. And I note that the re retaining wall is backset into the property, the rear garden of 27, and there is um, ground which has now been sort of encapsulated within a proposed um, wooden boarded fence. Has there, or is there any drainage on the back of the retaining wall and down below um, the retaining wall that would provide runoff into 73 may or may not be an issue. Um, I'm just uh, wondering okay. about those things. I'll just take you back to the drawing members just to, to see. So the proposed plans then are on the screen and you can see the, the retaining wall then is number four. Uh, just so you know the, the, the proposal that's before you. In terms of the stability of the wall, um, I have raised this with uh, building control and uh, as it's not affixed to the property or the dwelling, no building control permission is required. In terms of planning permission um, and the planning legislation, that wouldn't go as far as requiring any uh, comment on the stability of the wall and that would be a civil matter between the parties. Uh, in terms of the groundwater uh, and the runoff from the property, yes, uh, that is an important consideration. And had the levels not been reduced, then officers would have had a significant concern on that. But you can see from the landscape bank that a significant portion of the soil up against the wall is being removed. And there'll only be a small area now of soil up against the retaining wall. Um, so there's uh, there's no concerns then about the um, surface water runoff affecting the neighbours and getting into neighbouring property. We do not have any details though on the means of surface water disposal from that area. Um, however, it will be for the applicant to ensure that he doesn't cause a nuisance to the neighbour and have to connect into his existing drainage. Okay, Councillor Dehan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Darren, for your very comprehensive report and, and all the drawings. Um, so, Chair, uh, my concern would be uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, in relation to the overshadowing uh, uh, onto the objector's garden in the evening. Um, these amended plans, I take it, Chair, uh, would reduce that overshadowing. Uh, and secondly, in terms of the specific uh, danger of the structure, uh, in terms of climbing hazards or whatever, the amended plans, um, is the officer satisfied uh, that those concerns have been addressed in the amended plan? Thank you. Uh, so again, in, in relation to the uh, impact on the neighbours, uh, and uh, one of the objections raised by the neighbour is of overshadowing, and they have sent in a photograph uh, showing that, and that's available to view on the public access. The um, overshadowing is a concern, uh, and you can see from the slides on the screen that the existing house number 27 uh, and the retaining structure is to the west of the objective's property. So in the evening, the sun then will come round and it will be at a lower angle in the late evening. So there will be overshadowing from the house and the wall upon the property. The question then is the degree of overshadowing that's created by our development. And that's the important thing. 
as it stands, the, the retaining wall and the large fence on top of it does significantly cause overshadowing, uh, and officers had concerns on that previously. Uh, however, this now amends the scheme and takes that upper retaining wall, upper fence off. The new fence then is set back, uh, and as a result of that setback, the angles then will mean that there won't be any significant overshadowing on the neighbour. There may be some, however, uh, the degree of impact then will not be significant, and for all mornings, all afternoons, uh, there will be no overshadowing. In terms then of the danger of the structure, again, similar to the previous question, um, building control consent is not required for it because it's not affixed to the house. The um, technical details on how it's been constructed is a civil matter for the developer to ensure that they have uh, they've constructed appropriately. Wouldn't be a material consideration for planning. Thanks for letting me back in again. Um, the issue of overshadowing, I think if you look at the previous diagram that you had up there. Yep. So? Yeah. Number 27 is a two-story house. Uh, and number 73 is a bungalow. So before any structure was put in, uh, if you take straight angles, depending on the elevation of the sun, the sun in the summertime is at a high angle. Obviously, the element of overshadowing in the evening will be less. In the wintertime, uh, with the two-story house, it will be far more. So effectively, if you look at what is proposed, um, the overshadowing is actually negated by the overshadowing uh, already presented in part by the house itself. There are only sections of the fence to either side that are blanked out um, by the house. And that will depend on the orientation of the sun, uh, depending on the month of the year. Um, if there's a lot of cloud cover, there may be no overshadowing at all. So it's right to take it, but I think in essence, it is not as big a problem um, as presented uh, by the objectors, purely from the topography uh, and the direction of the diagram. And in that regard, um, with the information provided and the answers I had in regard to the wall itself, I'm happy to propose a recommendation of approval as proposed by the officers. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Dar Darren for his uh, clarification uh, of the questions. And uh, bearing bearing in mind the officer's um, report, I'm happy to second uh, uh, the approval of this planning application, Chair. Thank you. Okay, so we have a proposal by Councillor Irving, seconded by Councillor Deacon. Are we all in agreement? Members? Okay, members, so the recommendation then was to approve plan permission um, for the reasons listed within the report. Members have granted permission uh, subject to the four or the three conditions. Uh, just to advise members that they do require uh, works to be carried out and officers will inspect those to ensure that they're carried out appropriately within the time frames. Okay. Uh, item six, application number two, LA 10 2020 0171A. Uh, that's the shop sign, billboards and proposed totem sign. And we do have speaking rights in respect of this application and at the appropriate time I will uh, bring in uh, the speaker, Mr. Heron. Hey, Darren. Remember, so application two, LA 10 2020 171. Uh, it's an advertising consent for three shop signs, four billboard signs and a proposed new totem sign. Uh, for Mr. McKegney at the uh, McKegney Shop, 81 Main Street in Temple. Um, just before we go through the presentation, members, uh, you'll note from the report, the application was previously recommended for part approval and part refusal. Uh, at the meeting in December 2020, the committee agreed with officers uh, and the, propose, uh, the proposal before you then was uh, part approved and part refused. Um, subsequent to that, the applicant then has amended the application and amended the proposal and is now seeking a proposed totem sign. Previously, it was to retain the one that was there. He's now amending that, and he's going to put in a reduced one, which will come to. Um, the amended plans then have been received with amended descriptions, etc., and all the papers have been uh, been through the due process. Council has also consulted with the Department for Communities uh, in respect of the setting of the nearby listed buildings, which was a major issue in the previous uh, consideration. They have applied, replied that they are content uh, and do not have any issues in relation to the amended proposal. 
So the application is now returned to the committee with a recommendation to approve the proposed totem sign. Uh, the other signs have been granted consent previously. If this application is approved, then one application will be issued and that will uh, approve the whole lot. Okay. So the sign then is located at the garage. I'm sure members know it well in the Main Street Temple. You can see then the shop then in the top left with the road down at the blue line. And the circle then shows the location of the new totem sign. And then this is the plans then showing the existing sign on the left. And you can see then the proposed totem sign on the right hand side. So the new sign then will be 5.6 metres in height. Uh, essentially you're lowering the height of the structure and you're re removing the two elements, the post office uh, and the other elements of the sign. Then you can see in red on the left hand side. From the Inniskillen direction then, driving along the street, you can see the proposal. Uh, with the reduced signs on the slide and again there's no issues in respect of the impact in the setting of the listed buildings or upon the streetscape from the opposite direction then um, this is a, a photo montage then of the reduced sign uh, as it has been lowered the reduction then lowers it to the uh, reflect the height of the bungalow next door so when you're driving along it will be viewed against the bungalow and won't project above the bungalow or interfere with the setting of the listed building which is the uh, to the rear of the property. So the top of the sign will be about 99.37 and the top of the bungalow is about 99.52. So there will be a, a significant improvement then in the appearance of it. The officers have um, reconsidered it and taken advice from the Department for Communities and now their recommendation then is to approve advertising consent for the signage. Apologies. So um, I am now invite a uh, speaker in support of the uh, the application. That's the agent, Mr. Paul Heron, um, to uh, speak to us via WebEx. We have ten minutes uh, for this part of the um, representation. I just check if check if Mr. Heron can hear us. Okay. You don't seem to have uh, all here and present in our participant list at the moment. We haven't been informed of any issue. Councillor Irving. Chairman, I'm aware that we had extensive um, conversations and discussions when this came before the committee last time. And as Darren has so rightly said, we part approved and part uh, rejected um, the original application because it was multifaceted. Um, this is the part of the application that was for refusal and was the totem pole. I'm actually now happy to see that following discussions with the applicant and the agent, that the issue of the height has been removed and therefore the issue uh, that it was affecting um, the historic building, uh, the church on the main street has now effectively been taken away because as members noted at the time, all it needed was a reduction not even a change in design or anything, but a reduction. So the totem sign read below the ridge height of the bungalow in between the um, three-storey buildings and the, and the church. Look, in that respect, uh, I understand their speaking rights here, but I am happy to actually propose that we go with the, the officer's recommendation to approve. We've talked about this, we've seen it. The problem has been sorted out. I, I feel we don't have to wait for the agent, we can go ahead. So I'm happy to uh, propose approval. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. I'm in the same lines as Councillor Irwin. That was the height of the sign the last time in fact in the church. So I'm happy to second the, the proposal. Okay, Councillor Coyne. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, fully concur with Councillor Irvine's. Um it's good that um the agent and the applicant, you know, did work with the planning officers for to come to uh, you know, agreement. It 
uh, safeguards, you know, safeguards are heritage uh, in, you know, the Tempo village, like, and uh, safeguards the church. So uh, I think it's a win-win situation for everyone. Yep, the improvements are clear in the presentation. So we have a proposal in the secondary. Are we all in agreement? Thank you, members. Uh, okay, members, so the application was recommended for approval. Members have now granted uh, consent for the proposed totem sign. Uh, and as I say, the decision will now be issued for all the proposed signs uh, at this location. Okay, members, so just to note that application three has been deferred. So we're moving on now to application number four, and that's LA 10 0735F. And that's the housing development comprising of four semi-detached dwellings and a private access road. I should say we do have speaking rights in respect of this application as well, and I, I will invite the um, speaker forward uh, shortly. Right. Yeah, just having technical difficulties here. Uh, Chair, if you could just give me a second. Just changing the presentation. Perhaps at this point, members, we could take maybe a, a short break, just given the, the temperature and everything else proposed by Councillor Irving, seconded by Councillor Coyle. We meet back again and say three o'clock, that's seven minutes and a bit. Thank you, members.
Okay, members, we're, we're back. Um, so we're going to go back to application number four. That's LA 10 2020 0735F. Okay, members, so application four then, LA 10 2020 0735F. It's full application for uh, proposed housing development consisting of four number semi detached dwellings, so it's two pairs of semis, uh, and a private, a private access road. The applicant then is CT McNabb, and the location then is 30 metres west of 5 Burles Glen Drum Quinn. The recommendation then is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the one reason. Just take you through the details then, members. Um, the proposal is, is for a pair of semi detached dwellings in Drum Quinn. Uh, the issue then is the relationship with Burles Glen, which is shown on the screen, and you can see the existing development that's there. The new development then, by contrast, is significantly denser in appearance, and this detracts from the quality of Burles Glen and is the appearance of being squeezed into the site. So the block plan then on the screen shows the location on the top left, then you can see in the red rectangle the location of the two pairs of semis. Burles Glen then you can see comes in off the Omer Road uh, and down and then there's housing either side of the existing estate road. The houses at the Omer Road are semi-detached properties. And then the houses on the other side are detached houses with large rear gardens by generous plots. The proposal then is to extend the existing estate road in between number five and number six uh, using a, a new roadway with a footpath along the left hand side of the foot and a turning head at the end. The two properties then, or the two block buildings, will be sited on the left hand side facing on to the new estate road. The limit of development of Drum Quinn then runs along the yellow line. And you can see then just at the top of the slide then the proposed treatment plant, which is suitable for four dwellings to be installed then in the area shown on the, this, the slide. There are no details of the proposed treatment plant, but those can be submitted then post consent. And that will remain a private treatment plant uh, until at times it would be adopted by NI Water. But at the moment it's to remain private. Along the left hand side, you can see the uh, buffer which is uh, along the edge of the river and all trees and vegetation uh, will be retained within that buffer and shall not be disturbed. But just to zoom in a bit closer then, you can see then the car parking. Uh, there's two pairs, two spaces at each property uh, and those will be at the very front of the properties. So you have a line of four, pro four spaces um, and people then will reverse out onto the uh, estate road. The settlement limit then runs along the yellow line. Back gardens then are in accordance with the guidance in creating places and uh, the oil tanks etc are shown and then to be fencing to create a sense of uh, privacy for the occupants of the properties. The two semis then you can see the elevations on the screen so it's the front and rear and then the two side elevations. And then the house plans are standard uh, with the ground floor lounge and kitchen and then upstairs three bedroom and a bathroom with an ensuite. Again, the critical issue then, members, is the sense of place. Um, new residential development to meet the planning policy should display a quality, create a sense of place in keeping with the character and appearance of the area. For the reasons listed in the report, the development is out of keeping with the character of the area. The houses along this side of Burles Glen, so you can see number 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, are all detached properties on generous ample plots. Uh, there is a space in the rear, number 5, which is within the settlement limit and is suitable for housing. However, the proposal to put the two pairs of semi has the appearance of being squeezed onto the plot out of keeping with the character and appearance of the area. That, is, uh, that appearance is further detracted by the creation of the four spaces at the front of the properties in contrast to the other houses which have encouraged parking at the sides. So the recommendation then is to refuse planning permission. And the summary of the reason for refusal then is that the proposed development is currently the policy as it's not a quality residential development and is out of keeping with the overall character and environmental quality of the established residential area by means of overdevelopment of a restricted site. Okay, members, <clears throat> at this point, we have representation by the planning agent, Mr. Marcus <laughs> Kerr, who joined us via Beck. You're very welcome, Mr. Kerr, and uh, in your own time, you have 10 minutes uh, to address the committee. Thank you, Chair and Committee, for giving us the chance to speak. Um, 
you've seen the, the plans on the on the screen there, the site is located within the settlement limits of Drunk uh, One. It's to the rear of, of the borough's Glen development. The same developer built this in 2006-07. I suppose around the, the, the boom time, uh, there was a mix of detached and semi-detached houses. Uh, the houses are similar character to the existing and uh, a similar layout. If we could look at the block plan perhaps again, um, I suppose really the main contention here is the size of the plots and how they're, they're located on the plot. Yeah, that one. If we look at plots 12 to 16 in the existing development, these houses that we have are basically the similar footprint to those, similar size. The rear garden space, if we compare them with 12 to 16, they are of similar similar size and I mean Darren has already uh, alluded that we have ab adequate I mean this space 70 square meters to be in the minimum we have 72 on average there so we meet all uh, regulations in that regard with regard to the parking at the front I mean the other houses 12 to 16 the parking is at the side and to the front of those as well it's maybe not indicated on that plan there but uh, we don't have completely tarmacked at the front. We have four parking spaces which are tarmacked. We do have a grass area. If we look at the plan there, which is 17, 18, 19 and 20, there's a path along the front. That can be grassed between the parking and the path at the front. So it's not completely hard standing. It will not just be a massive black tar. Um, there will be parking at the front, but there will also be adequate room there if we if we if we need to grasp that. And I mean, that can easily be conditioned on the on the approval. So I think if we keep in mind looking at twelve to sixteen and comparing with with what we have proposed, they are very very similar in size, plot size, plot depths. Um, I think it's maybe a wee bit of an exaggeration to say that this is crammed. It's, it's definitely not crammed. And I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to create houses now. The boom time might have been a wee bit different. There was plenty of bank money about, but things have changed. There's a lot of people in Drumquan would probably want to stay in Drumquan. I mean, the developer sitting beside me, and he's, he's a Drumquan man himself, born and bred, you know. There's lots of people looking for houses. He has been contacted by several people within the village that don't want to go to Oma. They want to stay in their own fun. Uh, Burrell's Lane was a very popular development. It was well finished, well done. The houses sold very, very quickly on it. And the fact that now they've got sort of a word that they may be four more, there's, there's people inquiring about them, but they want them at a price. They want affordable. They're not they're not millionaires, you know. They want affordable houses. Um, just a, a standard family house for, for uh or to stay in the village and, uh, you know, not to have to go to Oma or, or Saban or wherever. They want to stay within the village. So I think that's that's sort of addressed the amenity areas. Um, I mean, it's tucked in the back of Burles Glen, so it's not a continuation of Burles Glen. It's not read in conjunction with the front row. It is a spur road off. It is the rear. It is lower. I don't think you read this in conjunction with the other houses uh, and the fact that do we have to keep the same? Do we have to continue the same? Is variation not good? You know, um, I think variation is positive. It's not negative. Um, the planners actually coincidentally state in the report that the addition of four dwellings is unlikely to cause a significantly greater impact than what exists. So I'm kind of a wee bit bewildered by that one, but. I'll maybe leave, leave that one for Darren to comment. Um, so really, I suppose, to sum up, it's it's affordable homes, 1,100 square foot, three bedroom homes to suit, you know, a family, local people to stay in their local area. Um, as I say, there's, there's loads of people here to look for them. Um, I suppose, I mean, the developer just handed me the wee thing here, but, you know, there's 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 a lot of investment in the drum plan there recently, the new gym facilities, uh, different things going on, the local football club, you know, there's there's a lot of amenities there, and people want to stay, you know, kids go to the club, play football, down to the gym, support the local businesses in the village, the village doesn't need to be losing people, 
the shops, etc., need to be they need to be keeping people in the village. Um, so you know we're trying to address that. We're not building huge big houses here that people can't afford. We're building reasonable priced houses, and at the end of the day, you know that's that's really what we're trying to create here. So I think that's really all I have to say, unless that anybody wants to to question me. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kerry, you've kept comfortably within the allocated time. Uh, members, have you any questions for the agent? We don't seem to have any questions. Thank you, um, Mr. Kerry. So we'll, sorry, sorry. Councillor Irving. Marcus. Marcus. Uh, Marcus, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying in regard to trying to keep people in Drum Quinn, but that's not necessarily a material consideration that the um, planning committee can take in. And they appreciate what you're trying to do. Uh, you're trying to say variation is good. Um, what we're seeing is a row of semi detached and then a row of detached. And you're actually making um, an alleyway, uh, a narrow private road in between the detached to put um, two semis in. I appreciate developers want to squeeze, and I'll use the word properly because I've been in building and trade, as you know, uh, as much in as they can on what grounds available. But it may have been a consideration that uh, maybe you should have gone for three rather than four, and then you would have tried to mirror uh, possibly the existing semi-detached within Burrell Glen and create less of a contrast. Because what we have to consider basically is not only the amenity, but it's the existing dwellings around and how they will read. And you're saying that they may or may not read. They're tucked in the way. But the problem is you will read them when you go down there. You'll see them down through. So it's just a thought throw, thrown out to you in that regard. And I appreciate you have to. To, to build the standard, but again, that's not our problem as a committee. We have to ensure quality development, no matter how big or small. Okay, um, Mr. Kerr, wish to respond? Yeah, uh, do you mind if I respond to that, Chair? Go ahead, there. Uh, I suppose uh, I can go back to our previous where we started on the block plan. There is existing semis within this development, number 12 to 16, the same footprint, same size, and the same garden space. We do meet the amenity levels. Uh, it's it's definitely not cramming. This is this is sort of mirroring the semis that's already in the development. Okay, members, um, any further questions for the agent? No further questions, I maybe thank the agent for his representation and ask uh, our plan officer, Darren, if he has any comments to make. Uh, Members, nothing really to add to the, the comments that have been raised previously in the discussion. Uh, I just would point out though, there's a reference there and a comment made about these being affordable homes, uh, etc. Um, there's no information on the file uh, other than that these will be sold in the private market uh, and they're not uh, social housing or anything like that. We have no information on that. They won't be conditioned. So if approval is granted, they can be sold openly for the market value. Okay, members. So I'll invite any questions you might have for the officer in respect of the application or indeed any comments at this point. Councillor Garrity. Thanks, Chair, and, and Darren and all uh, involved at this stage. I suppose the planning and flood risk and the nature conservation is a bit of a concern for me, Darren, and we are all know with climate change now and how it really is affecting us going forward. You did say that there is a possibility for development on that site. Um, was those conversations had direct with Mr. Kerr, the applicant, to see what would be best suitable so that that would be, we don't want any negative impact on neighbours. So was there a direction given that 
say two houses would be suitable or more appropriate or one or was that advice given to the agent? Uh, there was no direct advice given to the agent about what would be suitable although I did uh, discuss with the agent just you know the concerns of officers and we th how we thought the two pairs of semi was just too much um, but the agent was uh, was keen to bring the application forward and wanted to see what the outcome of the uh, committee would make on it so if officers are sorry if the committee are of minded uh, that the application is unsuccessful and should not be approved then uh, if you want to you could defer it back to officers and we can get into those negotiations and see because there is a there is an approval here uh, for new housing uh, because the site's inside the limits so it will be permitted it's just the numbers and the design of those uh, and what the agent then is willing to uh, maybe amend the application for if he's not willing to amend it then the application could be issued as a refusal and he'd have the right of appeal yeah i just think thank you darren for that i think uh, mr Kerr's outlined uh, the absolute need in local villages for people want to, to retain there and, and the benefits of that for individuals and communities and i certainly would support that um but i just think those conversations would be best to have because again there is huge flood risk issues there um and we certainly don't want to see in a number of years time something that would be just damaging to someone else so that may be an option darren but i'll see what the committee thinks as we go forward thank you okay councillor dehan uh thank you chair uh thank you darren for your report and mr Kerr contribution. Uh, just chair, if I could have Darren's opinion. Uh, Mr. Kerr was saying really that, you know, when you look at the uh, block plans, uh, the the houses in Burles Glen 12 to 16, that their footprint is really similar uh, to the, uh, the houses um, that are subject to this planning application. And also that uh, they, this new development really wouldn't particularly read with the other houses in Burl, Burl's Glen that they are actually at a lower level. So could I have uh, some comment from da uh, Darren on that, Chair? Thank you. Certainly, yeah. Um, so it's uh, like it's not a numbers game. You don't add up the houses and work out the site areas and see which is bigger or smaller. It's all about the appearance of these uh, and how it looks and how the, uh, the development will appear within its context. The semi-detached properties are numbered there on the screen. You can see them uh, starting on the right of uh, 12, 14, 15, and 16, were spe specifically raised by the agent. If you go on across then one, two, three, and four, though, have a larger plot size, you know, so there is a variation here, um, and that's how the new development will look and appear and fit into that. The concern of officers is that the location of this plot is at the back of the detached houses. They're on very generous plots. Uh, I think everybody would agree with that today, looking at them. And this is an area of land that has been left in at the rear. I just, um, the officer's views would be that this, the, the two buildings, so the four semis, is just squeezing in too much onto a site that really can't take it. And that will be out of context with the surrounding area. And one of the key features of that is the fact that the parking spaces are going to be put at the front of the building, four spaces on each property and how that looks. That just shows to me really that it's an overdevelopment of the site and uh, out of keeping in with the character of the area, especially that top half of the Burles Glen, which is all the detached houses. Thanks, Sir Irving. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Darren, could, could I get uh, a feeling from you? I think um, I'm of the opinion that there are too many for the site, but the site could be developed. And a conversation, as Councillor Garrity said, needs to take place, I think, between the applicant agent and our officers. Um, whilst I'm not immediately minded to refuse, or maybe, but I think of a deferral back to talk about this. And if there's any movement, um, we could leave it to officers. If not, it'll come back as a refusal to the committee. Is that an option open to us? Oh, it's your call. It's your decision. Well, I think... I appreciate what the agent has said on behalf of the applicant in regard to that there is demand within the area and people want to live in the area. Whilst that's not a, a material consideration, it is something that I would think about. But I take on board definitely the officer's opinion in regard to the design, um, the density, the shaping of the two four dwellings on the site. And I do not think it reads well in regard to the rest uh, of the development but I do believe something could be put on and I appreciate the um, applicant wants to get as many 
sites as possible to maximise profit. But what we are here as uh, officers and members is to ensure that any development within our district complies with the policy and is to the highest standards possible. So in that regard, I propose that we defer the application back to the officers to have a further discussion with the applicant and agent to see if any agreement with regard to amendment can take place and further consultation. If not, uh, we'll leave it to the officers then to determine as a refusal and I would come back and I would be happy with the refusal if there's no movement. So I'm proposing a deferral. Thank you. I could just maybe comment. So just in terms of the process there, members to keep in accordance with the protocol. Um, so there would be no issue with what the suggestion is that it's deferred back to officers. Uh, officers then would get into discussions. If the outcome of those discussions is that an acceptable scheme can be found, um, then the application can be approved. Um, uh, it'll be have to go on the weekly list though because of the objection. If it's a refusal, again, it would have to go on the weekly list. Uh, officers would have to let you see their, their recommendation to refuse. If it is not called in, then it can issue. If it is called in, it would have to come back to the committee. So it would be like a normal application again. Happy with that, Chair. Thank you. Sir Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. And I hear what Marcus has said there, and there's no doubt about it. Obviously, the agent is, uh, and we all know what people want to stay in their own towns and villages, and, that, and that's very, very understandable in the times that we're in as well. I'm inclined to uh, want to second Councillor Irvine's proposal, because I think it, uh, there's uh, for a deferral, because I think there's more uh, negotiation to be done between the planning officers, the agent and the applicant. So I'm prepared to second at this time uh, Councillor Irvine's proposal for a deferral. Thank you. Okay, members, so we have a proposal by Councillor Irvine, seconded by Councillor Thompson to defer the application. Are we all in agreement? Okay. Okay, members, so the recommendation then was to refuse uh, for the reasons listed within the report, subject to one reason. Members have gone against the recommendation uh, and have deferred the application and delegated authority back to officers uh, to consider uh, amendments to the scheme and liaise with the applicant. Uh, the application then will be dealt with in accordance with the normal processes for applications under the uh, processing. Okay, members, so application number five is LA 10 2021 0042F, and that's retention of a single story agricultural building for the use of storage, farm and feed, feed farm feed and farm machinery, tractor and implements. And uh, I should advise there is speaking rights. I request it in, re in respect to this application, and we will um, bring in the speakers at the appropriate time. Okay. So, members, application five then is LA 10 2021 0042. It's a full application for the retention of a single story agricultural building for the use of storage of farm feed and farm machinery uh, and tractor and implements is, is listed on the description. The applicant then is Francis McKnight, and the location then is a site 140 metres northeast of 17 Bit Dairy Bard Road in Fintna. The recommendation then is to refuse planning permission, the reasons listed within the report, and subject to two reasons. So, members, that's the on the screen then is the farm maps uh, of the applicant. So, this is in the first map, and you can see the parcels of land, and then the second map then which shows the additional parcels of land. The proposal then, as you'll note from the report, is to retain a partially erected farm shed for general agricultural use. There is an active and established holding and business, uh, and that relates to the farm maps that are on the screen. Um, there is a principal farmhouse uh, and a yard, and the agent has helpfully annotated that on the farm maps, so you can see that down the bottom left. The location then of the farm shed is not beside the principal farmhouse, but is within field three, which is shown on the screen. And uh, I'll come on to that in more detail. The annotation from the agent also shows the brother's house uh, and notes that he's associated with the farm business. Just to go through the diagrams then, the um, site location plan shows the location of the building within the red outline. And you can see at the top of the slide, the L-shaped building. Then the access is via the red line, which comes down onto Dairy Bard Road to the existing farm entrance. So just to give you some more details on that, members. So you can see the top of the slide then, the shed to be retained. 
is at the blue star at the top of the slide. And the yellow star then is adjacent to an annotation where the agent is referred to hard standing in laneway to the front of the yard, which was there from at least 2011, uh, as per the uh, attached map extracted from Google Earth, and I have those later to show you. Going down the, the laneway then, you can see at the green star, there's a, a note of a sheep shed shelter built seven years ago and a sheep paddock. And then if you continue down the lane towards the road, towards number 17, at the red star, you can see the dwelling associated with the farm, which is a farm employee. So in terms of distances then, the shed is 75 metres at least from the sheep shed, which is shown on the screen. Uh, and the, the shed then is at least 140 metres between the location of the shed and the number 17 bottom. Well, just to show that on the aerial photograph saying you can see then this is an aerial photograph showing the proposed site and the yellow star at the top right of the slide and you can see the what appears to be the concrete base and then the laneway coming down onto the road if you look across the road then at the red star that's the location of the principal farmhouse and farm buildings in terms of the proximity to the objector they they live in the property identified by the red star and you can note the position of their house just beside the red star with them with a the number of farm buildings and outbuildings at the rear and there is some existing trees and landscaping around their property which screens the site well building itself then uh, that's the front elevation in the top slide so it's about 4.9 meters in height the, the gray wall and roof cladding with smooth concrete the left hand half is open fronted the rear elevation then uh, again you can see that it's a cladded and shuttered wall Side elevation then shows a building about 18.5 metres in length. Sailor side elevation at the bottom. Floor plan then, uh, the building is divided in two. So the left hand side is the straw and hay storage area. And that's open fronted, closed into the other three sides. The right half then is a large sliding door to be proposed on the front. And that will be used to store agricultural machinery Overall, the building is 14.7 metres wide. The straw and hay storage area is 12.4. On the right, then, the agricultural machinery is 18.5 metres long. And as I say, it's been partially constructed. And that's a photograph just showing the building. So, remember, just from that photograph, if you uh, stand there facing the building, if you turn around and look down the laneway, you can see then the, the grey... Uh, bungalow down at the road with the dormer in the roof space and that's the brothers uh, the applicant's brother uh, and as noted on the application they are involved in the farm just to the right hand side of that building you can see there's some small small sheds uh, and those are the sheep pens and that's those structures in front of you So in relation to the issues members, you'll note from the report that the, uh, there is an existing farm group, but it's not uh, cited beside that. The existing farm group then is shown on the screen as the aerial photograph. So you can see the house, the L-shaped house, or sorry, the house at the front with an L-shaped building at the rear and then three large sheds, the back one annotated by the yellow star. Uh, you'll note members from the report, the agent makes a case that the building is to house existing machinery that is uh, stored outside uh, and... Uh, from the aerial photograph, uh, there doesn't appear to be any machinery stored outside. Um, from the site visit this morning as well, I didn't identify any, and it's a very clean and well-kept farm with no evidence of any outside storage of any equipment or machinery demonstrated. And in support of the application, the agent has sent in four appendices, so I'll put these on the screen uh, for your information, and he's likely to refer to those. So that's Appendix 1, which is a flyover photograph of the 30th of April 2011. Appendix 2, which is the 8th of April, 17. Appendix 3, then, is the 17th of July, 17. And then the November, the, sorry, the 11th of March, 2020, which is Appendix 4. So the recommendation then, members, is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report. Um, there's uh, two reasons for refusal. First one then is the proposal is contrary to policy in that the proposal is not cited beside existing farm buildings and the development is not an exception as there are alternative sites available at the existing group of buildings in the holding that are suitable for development. 
and also then the, the development has not been demonstrated to be essential for the efficient functioning of the business. Essential then is to test their members that the applicant has to demonstrate a high standard that this building is essential for the running of it. Therefore, the use uh, is key and evidence in demonstrating why it is now needed is key uh, to support that. Uh, there's also no demonstrable health and safety reasons for the alternative site away from the existing buildings. And then as a result of it being counted at policy CTY 12, it also fails to meet CTY 1. That would obviously drop if members considered it met 12. Okay, members, we're at this point, we're going to um, invite representation uh, by the plan agent, Mr. David McKinley. Uh, Mr. McKinley, you're very welcome. Uh, and as you know, uh, there's 10 minutes allocated to this part of the meeting. Sorry, can you hear me okay? It's just a little bit low. We'll just check. Can we get the sound raised a bit? Uh, Chair, um, I had uh, requested speaking rights on the, for this uh, application, and I see I'm being excluded. Councillor, uh, my apologies, you're not excluded. Um, I'm taking the speaking rights for the agent first, and then I will um, take speaking rights for the councillors in relation to this application. That's Councillor Bert Wilson, yourself, Councillor, Councillor uh, Mark Buchanan, and also Thomas Buchanan, MLA, as well, and those are and those are all via WebEx as well. So there will be an opportunity, five minutes allocated to those representations, Councillor. Can you hear me okay now, Chair? We can indeed, yes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the committee for letting me speak on behalf of the applicant. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Um, I reviewed the planning report presented to the committee. I have a couple of comments to make to help support the application. Firstly, the planning service is content that the proposal presented that does not have a detrimental impact on the neighbour uh, that has objected. Uh, this is also the case for the environmental health department. EH would report one of the issues with noise and smell, and there's, there's, there's no issues that I've read the EH with the environmental health department's report. Now, road services are content that the access is, is fine, so there are two sprays which are available within the glass period. Um, I've, I've got asked Darren to go back to the, the aerial view of the, the farmyard. Uh, there, that one there, that one there. Um, we, we, we sent out a cover letter with it basically stating that the width of the farmyard that's currently in front of you is, is between two hedges. There's an adjoining farmyard right beside it. If Darren would go back to the blue and red outline, oh, please. The, uh, another one. And that's it there. Uh, you can see clearly in the middle of it where I've seen the existing farm entrances off the very, very far road. That that access is actually shared with the joint number number 14, which actually owns it. So if you look at it, there's a quite a tight bend and angle into number 16. That, that's been very restrictive for for the, the, the farm in regards to sort of acquiring large loads of straw and hay and what have you. Uh, as you look at number 16, it's 16 at the base of the hill, or as you stand and look south, which is which is this where the buildings are. That steps up quite rapidly to green and nice look, about one in, one in 10, one in 12. Um, you can also see from that, that that the development limits between the two the two blue lines is very restrictive, leaving a minimal opportunity to develop. And we made that sort of clear in the letter that there was no development opportunities at the Existing, excuse me, at the existing farmyard, uh, sorry, the principal farmyard and, 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 and dwelling. Darren, uh, if you go back to the photographs of the two shelters, please. Um, th this this field would be classed as, as, as an outlined farm, almost you've got a respected road to pass through, which is very hard road. You have one building there with a pen on it. Now, that, that's, that's a small holding pen to catch and work a cheap on this side of the lane. If you go to the next photograph, so it's the second one. Now, they are 10 buildings, but I believe. Uh, one of them has a little bit of traffic on the floor of it and, and a bit of a block wall up. So they are used as, as a sheep holding facility for, 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 for the few things that the, the dose and work at them. So I, I'm asking the question. I, I think that should be considered as, as an outlying farmyard. There's a minimum of two buildings and a pen. 
and we were then 75 meters off of of them buildings. Uh, so um, to consider it even further, uh, we're So this is we're here to present the council this afternoon application started. This has been going on since 2016. The lane has been made. Uh, this shade started back in 2016 with ordering of steel and bits and pieces. The, the shade didn't really go up to 19. Uh, the neighbor had an opportunity to object from 19 to 20, but didn't object till fairly late on, I think, the middle of middle of 20, uh, 2020. So again, this Planning service in the ESS have said that there's no issues with the with the with with, with, the, with the noise or or smell from the building. So in, in essence, in essence, we've ruled out the objector. So basically, the proposal does meet the criteria of CPY 12, and that the site at 17 there just behind it, or sorry, 16 very Road roads at the principal cannot sustain an additional building, as I've indicated in regards to the the, the gradient of the ground behind the farm and, and literally the limited space we have between blue line or boundaries. Uh, therefore, a set, an alternative site can be considered pending. Uh, it, it, it does integrate and complies with, in this case, CPY 13 and 14. Um, the development is essential. Uh, it's, it's, it's needed for, for the machinery and, and in particular for hay and straw. Uh, the machinery may not have been there. There's another outlying farm and they move them around as they need them. So waste is not there, but it will be on the other farm. Um, the land behind 17 to 16 is uh, less fair enough of coming to that. that. That's it, basically. So I'm asking, I'm asking the, the, the council to consider: is this an outlying farm, and is it side to side two two farm buildings and an enclosed pen also, uh, and uh, and the existing farm dwelling and farm yard is undeveloped. Uh, that's me. I'm finished. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. McKinley. You've kept well within the. Uh... The allocated time, and now invite members if they have any questions for the agent at this time. Uh, Councillor Irving. Thanks very much, Chair. David, can you hear me? I can, David. Look, um, our officers have two uh, recommendations for refusal. I mean, the first one basically is all around CTY 12. Um, essentially, is the development is no exception as there are alternative sites available. You've alluded to it slightly, but um, I think I would need more information to describe why um, you can't locate them with the main farm group. What you're saying is that this is a sub farm group. You want us to take into consideration that the two buildings as such constitute a farm group. But um, I think I, as a committee member, and maybe other uh, committee members, would need more information, more substantive information, to say one, uh, why this can't be contained at the main farm group, and what you actually needed for. You've alluded uh, storage of machinery and possibly hay, but I think we need some more information on that. So could you provide that, please, to aid us in our debate? And the the. Uh, the um they're, they're a sheep farmer. Uh, they, they rely a lot on hay uh, and straw, a little bit of straw for a little bit of bedding. Occasionally, when the, the lambs or the sheep are lambing, the hay is quite an important part of the straw. They're, they're currently buying bales of hay individually as opposed to a full load. Uh, and, and that's one of the two reasons that the cat guys typically get a large lorry into the main farmyard, uh, whereas they can on, 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 the, uh, on the new proposal. Uh, and there's enough room to turn back in and to not move full load. There's a financial implication on that in regards to a single deal collected or a full load delivered. Um, in relation to the farm machinery, once the down having spotted in it, there was, the day I was there, there was quite a bit of machinery. There was a tanker, there was a tractor, and a few other bits and pieces that are, well, they're obviously moved from the other outlying farm at present. So, so, so I suppose. I, I, I think of I think of given it as a as, 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 as a as a necessity. It's a necessity this building. It's it's, uh, it's not a it's not a cattle house, it's not a it's not a sheep house. It's basically simple, straightforward machinery shape, uh, sort of suited to what, what the economy needs. Okay, Councillor Garrity. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, uh, Mr. Um 
David, for your responses. It's the same vein as Robert, and you may have answered it slightly there for it, but you did allude to the machinery at the other farm. Um, have all possible eventual or possibilities been exhausted at the other farm to see that maybe it might be suitable to have the shed located there um, by the applicant in your shelf or the reason for maybe not investigating that? And sorry, uh, David, if you've answered it, there's a slight muffle in the in the in the voice. All right, I need to speak a little bit deeper. Uh, the the other client farm, those two fields also, it's not quite a part, quite a large farm complex. Um, I had a quick look at it. There was nothing really suitable in regards to integration, uh, and I, I just ruled it out straight away. In any case, they had this building sort of already started, and it started out from an enforcement case. Um, but in all reality, if the straw or hay or or machinery, we have a direct view from the house straight across to the shed behind the brother's house. Uh, Francis can see if anything's going on. The, the, there's obviously theft picking about, not necessarily from your thing, but in the area, that's quite often prominent. So, so was the one that the visual linkage to the main farmyard uh, and the principal farm dwelling, and in fact, number seven, which is the brother's house, just for just for just for security. Uh, the other outbound farms are two miles away. Uh, there's no opportunity to do that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, any further questions from members for the agent at this point? I don't see any indications. Okay, I'm going to now invite uh, representations by uh, by those who have been allocated speaking rights. And according to my list, is Councillor Mark Buchanan, Thomas Buchanan, MLA, and Councillor Berk Wilson. Uh, can I just check that all are present here? So Councillor Wilson is present. Yeah. Hello, hello, Chair. It's Mark here. And, and, and Councillor Buchanan. And, uh, Chair. Uh, just to clarify, um, my, my, my father, Thomas, just applied in case the meeting would run until tomorrow. So it's just myself today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor, well, in that case, then there, there's five minutes allocated to this uh, to this slot. And, and maybe amongst yourselves, uh, you can agree the timing and, and, and go ahead, whoever wishes to go first. Uh, Chair, I'll allow Councillor Buchanan to go first. Okay, Councillor. Thank you, members, and, and thanks, Chair, um, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'd like to speak in support of the application today. Um, there's no doubt that this is an act of farm and business, as has been made clear by the agent. Um, the, where, where the shed is located on the side of the road, um, we see that there's already uh, sheep buildings there, and there's, there is the need for this building, I believe, to meet with the, the storage and the needs of the business. Um, the shed is, is, has been there and it is integrated within the field and there is a good um, established laneway and into the shed as well. And as we've heard, it will be used for the storage of equipment and animal feed and even hay and things like that. And uh, I know I might not have a lot of experience of farming, but in my own experience, well, you, you couldn't have enough storage um, on the farm. And I would, I would encourage members, um, I believe that it is essential um, and, and that it's required and that it, it could be gripped with um, with those shades that are there and it is part of the of the main farm business. So I would encourage members today um, to support uh, the application and, and approve approve the, the farm shed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, Chair. I've known this lady from, I, I actually knew her father. She lives on her own. She would be uh, somewhere in her 60s, and her only interest is farming. She lived in that house. The fields that you're talking about where the yard is at present, she bought those couple of fields just around the house and uh, made use of them as best she could. But anybody, and I'm sure the planners can't deny that, that this, the laneway up to that shed, the existing shed, would be somewhere in the region of maybe 10 foot wide, maybe not, and uh, with a gradient of probably uh, eight inches and six. So in the winter time or any other time, there's no possibility of getting a lorry up there. And especially in the winter time, you couldn't even go on it because you would land down 
written into uh, at the bottom of it. As well as that, nobody so far has mentioned that there's a stream or a bourne running around the the, the, the front of our house. And down through that uh, field, the only field that would be any way suitable uh, for to build on that side of the road, uh, and that does be flooded. So there's no possibility, possibility of going there. Uh, Darren says about the machinery being, uh, yeah, but I don't know. I looked on the uh, application shed, the shed we're looking for now. There's a track digger in that. There's other machinery in it. Uh, although there's no roof on it, they're already in that because I visited and seen them. And uh, this lady has uh, the main property and land that she has is on the other side of the road. If that small shed is, yes, an emergency to put a sheep in, but if she has any stock to bring across the road or anything, it takes at least four people. The traffic from Drunquan, Trillic, Fintna and all, that's the main Derabard road. The traffic would have to be stopped by at least two people and two more to take, it out, take them out across the road. It is no way handy for a lady living on her own, and I know that uh, planners don't take that into account. But this, to me, is a, a, an emergency. It's a really, if, if this site is torn down, it's, it will be a total disaster for this lady. In fact, she told me this morning, if, if it's torn down, she says, I'm going to sell the place and get out. Because I, I'm really, I, she has been sitting for two years in the house looking after a, a relative who d died about two months ago. And she was hoping to get back to do a bit of farming again. Uh, the site that we're talking about is really in behind, as you've seen on the screen, really large trees, can't be seen from anywhere, and the, the uh, objection to it was not called for because the person that objected is already parking three containers on the side of the road. Uh, so that is really my case for this lady, and she has. Uh, there's no way that you could get a lorry in there. And if you build anywhere there, that the second house in that lane has already said they will be objecting. They won't allow it. So the the, the site that is under three quarter built, it only needs a roof, and that is all that, that it needs. And it's not seen from anywhere other than out of a helicopter. And there's an existing lane out on the Derbard Road, which is approved by the planners. And to me, it is an excellent site, and it will leave any work on that, which is where the, their main uh, property is. It's 12, 13 acres on that side of the road, and four or five round uh, where the planners are suggesting. So to me, it, 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 common sense, and that's all I'm asking, common sense, that's, to leave that site or that shed where it is and allow them to put a roof on it and complete it. That shed, I have re uh, receipts here from Johnny Donnelly where they, where, where they bought that steel in 1917 and 18. The roof and all, so uh, as I say, it's, I, I would ask the councillors to take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. We just reached the five minutes there, so thank you for your representation. Um, and I'm now going to uh, ask our planning officer if he wishes to make any comment. Yeah, just just to come back on a few issues raised there. Um, let me just go back to the start. So this is the farm maps uh, accompanying the application. And one of the issues raised by the agent was that this is an outlying farm. Um, so this is the this is a relevant uh, map, I think, which is of critical and when members are reaching that decision. So you can see at the bottom the fields are identified in yellow. And the principal farmhouse then is identified by the applicant uh, on the screen and shown there with the arrow over to it. And the farm buildings, the existing farm buildings then are at the rear. Uh, and then there are three fields to the rear of that property and then two more. You can see that number four and 3A, I think it is, beside that. Opposite then is field three. Uh, and that's the building in which the uh, building has been erected. The agent was trying to make the case of field three then as an outlying farm. Uh, and... Uh, uh, officers would, would rebut that. Uh, the fields in the top left of the slide, 25, 27, uh, A, D and B, would be an outlying farm because they're away from the farm group. But simply the fact that field three is across the road uh, would be uh, difficult to sustain the view that it is, is an outlying farm. In terms then of the, the proximity to the neighbour um, and the, uh, the objector then, um, the issues raised by the objector are summarised in paragraph four. Uh, and if you go through those, the officers do agree uh, with what the agent is saying and that a lot of the issues the, the objector has raised are not sustained. 
and uh, we wouldn't run with them. However, the, age, the objector has raised issues in relation to size and scale of the building, it being too large for the farming enterprise. It's inordinately far away from the farm holding uh, and mentioned other things too. Uh, officers would would see that uh, as an issue uh, and it remains an issue. Uh, the evidence has been submitted to accompany the application and that is ultimately what the application will be decided on, the evidence. So the evidence that accompanies the application has not demonstrated why a building of this size and scale is needed at this location. When you go through the information and the speaking rights there that the agent has come forward with, um, you know, there's no issue in the, or no, no mention of the number of sheep they have or what has changed and have they increased the flock or has there been a change there. Uh, which requires more farm feed or uh, bales other than they want to buy it in bulk. Um, there's no evidence of any growth of the business or no new machinery bought or any evidence of the machinery that has been stored outside, which now needs to be stored inside. I think there's a reference to the equipment that's in it. So that's the building at the moment. You can see uh, there is a digger uh, on the left-hand side, and I noted that when I was out, but the rest is just pallets and, and block work. So um, from the site visit, there wasn't any evidence of any machinery being out stored outside to support the argument of the agent. Uh, and again, I keep coming back to it. It's all evidence based. They, you know, they have to demonstrate this based on evidence. In terms of the proximity to the uh, farm buildings and the farm group, you can see yourself from that photograph, the distance from the uh, existing farm buildings, which are further down the lane. You will also note the existing laneway then is, is rough sort of stone with grass going up the middle of it. So it has very limited visual impact. So, members, if we just go through the reason for refusal again, as I say, this is this is based on the evidence, uh, and that's what has to be the, the determinant factor. So the building's not an exception, as there are alternative sites available at the existing group of buildings in the holding, and uh, the agent in my view hasn't ruled those out, other than to say that they can't get a large lorry in. The site could be developed. There is room in there physically to develop the buildings, and they could be put in without any detriment to meeting of neighbours. Part B then about essential, and that's the key thing. You have to demonstrate it's essential uh, for the efficient functioning of the business. In other words, what has changed and now requires you to have this building. C then is demonstrable health and safety reasons. So for the reasons listed, members, officers would uh, re re uh, recommend refusal uh, for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the one reason. Okay, members. Uh, Councillor Deegan. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you um, uh, for uh, the presentation, uh, Darren, and to the agent and the councillors for their additional information. I suppose, Chair, uh, a couple of questions for uh, Darren's opinion. Um, uh, if I interpreted uh, Councillor Wilson correctly, he said that this lady had been uh, caring for uh, a, a relative and that that relative had, has passed in recent months and that she's hoping to become more active in farming. Uh, and therefore, with that, you know, one would expect that there would be a requirement. Perhaps she's thinking of buying in more more animals, that there might be uh, a requirement for for uh, uh, feedstuff feed storage and so on. And then secondly, um, uh, Councillor Wilson also referred to a burn uh, that runs around the front of the house and also that the fields uh, beside the principal uh, dwelling were subject uh, to flooding. So I, uh, if I could just have Darren's comments on that, please, Chair. Thank you. Uh, so the information from Councillor Irwin about the relative uh, has not been submitted to accompany the application. It really is new information um, that shouldn't be brought to members today, but he has raised it. There's no evidence of that on the file. There's nothing to support that uh, discussion. And we yeah, the relative that. didn't die two, two months ago. Yeah, so it's, it's new information, members. Uh, Sorry, members, just to, to note that um, we cannot take any more contribution from the um, those with speaking rights at this stage. Yeah. So the, the expansion of a business, of a farm business, is something that the uh, planning department does uh, encourage, and we, we look at that as sympathetically as we can. And cases have been brought along where applicants have come along and said, this is my plans, and that's accompanied by evidence. So you have whatever business plans, banks support all sorts of evidence and information. When you have that all, it supports the case that they are planning to expand. When somebody just says to you, I'm going to expand in the future without any evidence, it's a very difficult position for the council to be in then to support, to support that case. In terms of the burn, um, I'll just go back to the, the photograph. That's that one there. 
So you can see then the farm group um, identified by the three buildings and then the fields uh, surrounding the farm. Top of the slide then you can see the sort of water course in grey running parallel with the laneway. That I think was what the agent was referring to as the water course. The land rises up quite steeply uh, and the agent does refer to that. Rises up quite steeply from the house and then the, the farm buildings sort of step up the slope. Um, so they are well away from the burn. In terms of the environmental impact of developing a, a farm shed there, uh, there are mitigation measures you can put in place to ensure there's no impact upon the burn, silt fencing and various other things there uh, to prevent any pollution or water uh, discharges uh, affecting the quality of the water. So that wouldn't be any issue in relation to, to developing the site. What is an issue though is the constraints of the site, which the agent has raised, and it is noted the, the narrowness of the site. Um, the sloping nature of it, uh, again, has been raised by the agent and it is a steeply sloping site. However, that does not prohibit the development of a new building. A new building could go in there, uh, taking advantage of the existing buildings that are there. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Darren is quite right in that the agent and both representatives um, have actually presented new information that, to be fair to our officers, they really haven't got enough detail on uh, to look and scan and obviously then uh, reconsider their um, determination in regard to the outcome of this application. I think for me as an individual member as well, um, there were references made to different things in regard to rebutting the reasons for refusal. But I think I would like more detail and more information around that and obviously to have that looked at by our officers. And in that regard, I propose a deferral back to the officers so that the agent and the applicant can provide proper detailed information that they have verbally referred to uh, and clarify their position and the need for this dwelling, sorry, not dwelling, building. Um, so that our officers then can properly determine and come back to us then with a recommendation that we can then properly discuss. So that's my proposal. Thank you. And I won't determine the outcome. Uh, I'll leave it up to the officers, whether it's a month or two, but I'll just say um, get the proper information and then the officers can bring it back after they've considered the information, the additional information provided. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Larry. Yes. Um Although I'm sure the materials weren't bought during World War One, I'm sure that the, they were bought four or five years ago, and and with the information that came forward as to suggest maybe might suggest why that building wasn't completed in a timely fashion, and again I don't think the agent or the speakers fully touched upon that, and I think to give them a fair opportunity, I would like to hear more information coming to to the officers so as they can make a more more uh, determined decision as to why why that delay was and why what way the business is going. So I'm going to second what Councillor Irvine's proposal. Sir Thompson. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I want to support Councillor Irvine's uh, proposal for a deferral. So I think there's a lot more information to be brought forward here in a, in a proper way. And uh, we probably haven't heard it all today but it will give opportunity for the, the plan officers and the agent and the applicant to have further discussions. Um, I support the deferral. Thank you. Councillor Deegan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I too support uh, the deferral. I certainly would like to give the applicant the opportunity of bringing uh, additional information before uh, the uh, committee uh, so that we can make a determination on this application. So I support the deferral, Chair. Thank you. Sir Garrity. Yes, very briefly, Chair, just to say I'm, I'm reading the room, as you would say, and I will um, reluctantly support what I think is the wishes in the room because, again, we have a situation where we went in to get the QRMOT, just getting in and done and getting the list and getting it afterwards. And I'm not a fan of that. And I don't want us giving out that message to agents that we can do that going forward. And, and in fact, that's what we're doing today. And we've done it before. And, and I know this is certainly not the first time, but I do think we, we do need to up our game in this regard. I don't want agents to slip and think that that's something that we will give in to. But as I say, I will support the deferral on this occasion as proposed by Councillor Irving. Okay, I'm Councillor McGuire. Uh, similar to, to, to Mary or Councillor Garrity there, I, I, I reluctantly will support the deferral. 
But again, I think at this stage, the, the agent should be fully aware that we do need that information front loaded uh, to continually defer. And we already had reference to deferrals earlier in the, in the meeting. It's not the best way for us to do our business. So I think all the agents should be fully aware at this stage that they need to get that information. And I'm sure Darren and the other planners do indicate that mm -hmm. uh, when they propose it to come in. But I will support the deferral here. Yeah. Okay, members, that point's been clearly made. So we do have a proposal by Councillor Irving, seconded by Clary. I'm just going to let Darren just in a second on that. Uh, members, just in relation to that and the comments that have been made there, um, uh, members will decide whether or not to defer. That is, that is your prerogative. Um, but officers will request that there's a time limit on, on the length of time that the, the deferral is granted to allow the information to come in. Um, try and keep on top of these deferrals. Is one month adequate? Yeah. Yep, yeah, one month. Okay, set deferrals for one month. Are we all in agreement? And that's delegated back to officers as well, just for clarity. Okay, so members, the recommendation then was to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report. Members agreed to go contrary to the recommendation of deferred the application and delegated the application back to officers to allow the agents to submit more information uh, in support of the application, and that information should be submitted within one month of the date of today's meeting. Okay, members. Uh, so application number six, uh, LA 10, 2020-09150, and that's proposed site for a dwelling and domestic garage. And we do have speaking rights uh, in relation to this application, uh, and we will come to those um, uh, shortly. Uh, just going to ask Darren to introduce the application. So application 16. Members is LA10 2020-0915 is an outline application by Michael Daly uh, for a site for dwelling and domestic garage, uh, approximately 200 metres west of 125 Terman Road in Carrickmore. The recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the three reasons. I'll take you through the details, members. The, you'll look from the report, the application is, is for a new house on a farm under CTY10. The applicant, Michael Daly, has a farm business uh, ID with DARA, but uh, DARA have confirmed that the business is not collecting subsidies within the last six years and all entitlements were confiscated in 2012 due to non-usage. The applicant, uh, in support of the application, has submitted information seeking to demonstrate an active and established farm business for six years as the applicant maintains the land in good environmental condition. That evidence has been considered by officers uh, but has not uh, found to demonstrate that uh, a business exists over the six-year period. Uh, in addition, a development opportunity has been transferred off the holding from Michael uh, Daly to Barry Daly, and although Barry Daly has now joined the farm business in July 2020, at the time of the transfer, he was not far, part of the farm business, so the transfer was from the business to outside of the business. So the farm map then, members, on the screen then is Michael Daly's 2016 farm map. Uh, you'll note from the slide, the fields are identified in yellow. But, uh, the site then is the yellow star which is adjacent to several buildings to the south. Access then comes in off the public road along the private laneway, which is identified by the red line. And interestingly, there's no issues really being raised about getting a mortgage off a private laneway uh, in this case. You go on to the site location plan then, you can see the uh, Terman Road at the top of the slide. The red line then is the laneway coming in past 103 and down to the two farm buildings that are there at the bottom of the slide, with the site then the yellow star above those and that's just a zoom in then of the location of the site obviously a siting condition may be appropriate members um, given the size and scale of it but overall the site integrates uh, and uh, reads with the farm buildings in terms of the development opportunity transferred from the holding in 2014 uh, that's it identified by the yellow star it's number 103 as i say it was it, it was transferred from michael daly's farm holding to barry daly in terms of the reason for refusal, the recommendation then is to refuse planning permission for three reasons. Uh, the proposal is contrary to policy as the farm business is not currently active and established for at least six years. It's contrary to policy as a development opportunity out with the settlement limits has been sold off from the farm holding within 10 years of the date of the application. And then number three, the proposal is contrary to CTY1 
and that there are no overriding reasons why this development is essential in the rural location. Obviously, three would fall if members considered that it met CTY 12. Okay, members, at this point, we do have representations to be made. And firstly, just to note that we have um, speaking rights uh, from Mr. Chris Cassidy, uh, the agent. Uh, we also have um, Mr. Connor Daly present in support of the application. Uh, and then we have some <coughs> representations to follow by councillors Barry McElduff and Bert Wilson. Uh, but first of all, there's 10 minutes allocated uh, to the agent and Mr. Daly in support of the application. Uh, so uh, maybe amongst yourselves you can agree on, on how that time is allocated. These are both very welcome. And just in your own time, you can go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, members. My name is Christopher Cassidy. And I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. The 16 acre farm has been in the family for generations. Farmed by the applicant, Mr. Barry Daly, his father Michael, and Barry's brother Connor. The new house, if approved, will be for Connor. The farm has a Category 1 business ID number, Barry and Michael having an equal partnership in it allocated to them in 2005. They have a farm survey number and a dark customer ID number. Dark screenshots list the status of the farm as active. The site itself is set back 400 metres from the roadway, virtually unseen from any vantage point and clustered with their existing farm buildings. Specialists have identified three issues with application which I'll address in turn. Firstly, that the farm is not active. In order to establish if a farm is active, we would refer members to what the council consider to be necessary. Council defined the activity as has been the production, rearing, or growing of agricultural products, including harvesting, milking, breeding animals, and keeping animals for farming purposes, or maintaining the land in good agricultural condition and environmental. In support of maintaining the land in good, good condition, we have supplied invoices for money Mr. Daly has spent on the land over the last six years. These are noted in the case officer's report. They do not include any time the Daly's have personally spent on farm maintaining it over the years, which shows it's accessible. The receipts are examples of money spent and are not exhausted. They give an indication that this is not a hobby, a considerable sums of money have been spent maintaining it. Mr. Daly leases the single farm payments to a third party. A lease agreement is in place between the specifies Michael and Barry are responsible for all maintenance. A similar set of circumstances was considered in the planning appeals, a copy of which is attached to the application documents. In it, the Commissioner stated the farm policy does not outline a specific number of man hours of work on the farm, which must be carried out, and I am satisfied that the cutting of page rows and spreading of slurry on land is necessary for land and maintenance, regardless of the length of time taken to complete these tasks. Commissioner Grimmer continued the applicant maintains the land annually as well as cutting hay and silage. Therefore, I conclude that in these circumstances, the applicant makes a contribution that equates to policy requirements. When viewed on site, the land here is in good agricultural and environmental condition and has recently been put for silage by Michael and Barry. They do this annually and use their own equipment. This equates to the requirements of policy and clearly shows the applicant's for business is currently active. The second issue Chris will consider is said to be transferred at the voting since 2008. The site in question gained approval in 2002, six years prior to this actual policy being introduced. The house is constructed and occupied by Barry Daly, the applicant and member of the farm business. The plot was transferred into Barry's name for mortgage purposes. It has not been transferred off the farm as it remains within the ownership and control of the member of the business. Dart confirmed to Council in March and June 2021 that Barry is a full member of the business. There has been no neighbour objections to the proposal that all consultee replies have been returned favourably. Unusually, I have been inundated for neighbours who have admitted their support for the application and have asked to be speaking rights. As for already speaking, I declined any further requests. There are two sides to any set of laws. The words of the policy itself and the intentions are spread behind it. When we focus on the former, we risk overlooking the latter. Sometimes it's forgetting what the intention of the farm policy is, allowing farmers and their families to occupy the living with land they own. 
I believe it's a good policy which keeps rural communities vibrant and sustained. For these reasons, I would ask you to reconsider the application in the spirit of the policy. And the applicant to build his house on the Bonnie land. Thank you. Honor, do you want to say a few words now? Yeah. Um, all here, you can hear me all right. We can hear you fine, yes. Right yeah, so again, uh, my name is Connor Daly, uh, and I know the application is in Michael Daly's name. Um, the purpose of the application is for myself and my family to, to be able to build in a house on the land that I, I did grow up on. Um, and I understand the criteria and the policy has to be met, and Chris has alluded to that already. Um, but I, I'm appealing to you like on a personal level just to consider the spirit of the policy um, and what it means for farmers and families to live um, and farm and live in the land that they worked on. Okay. Um, as a just a person, on, on back, I can remember back to childhood days, sort of growing up, um, working on the land, and an actually the part where I'm hoping to get the house, uh, we actually farmed ostriches there, um, and that's part of the land that I'm hoping to build on. Um, so I have many fond memories of the summer months, growing up with my brother and my father, helping him on the farm. Um, I, I sort of attained to many duties um, on the farm between silage, um, around Balaam, uh, general duties, to make it easier for my father um, over the land. Um, and again, all my family live in the land. Family relatives live close proximity. Um, my own child will be starting P1 in the local area now in September. Um, and again, as Chris said, the farm has been in our family for many a year, for generations, and, and I'm hoping to continue that on. Um, so again, I know there's, there's other houses, uh, maybe for sale in towns and villages, but again, a home's a home, and a home on the land is, is that I grew up on is what I'm hoping that you will consider today. Um, so again, thank you very much for giving me the time to speak um, and thanks for everything. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Daly, and uh, also to Mr. Cassidy. I'd now invite members if they have any questions uh, for the agent or the applicant. Councillor Dehan. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Cassidy and Mr. Daly, uh, for your presentation. Um, Chris, the the sound quality wasn't particularly good, uh, so I just wondered, could you go over again the point about, um, you know, the transfer of, of an asset uh, uh, to Barry Daly? Uh, I didn't quite catch that point that you were making. Sorry, sorry, Commissioner. I hope that's a, a little better there. Uh, this is a bit technical. The, the house that we're talking about gained planning permission in 2002, uh, six years prior to this actual farm policy coming in. It was built by Barry and for some technical reason inside the solicitor's office, no fault of Barry or Michael, the solicitor didn't finalised the transfer until 2014. The house had been substantially built for a number of years before that. Uh, uh, regardless, Barry is a full member of the farm business. So with Barry being a full member of the business, there has been nothing, been, there's actually been nothing transferred, sold off the farm. It was never a sale to start with, but it certainly hasn't been transferred. And I think, in my opinion, it would be grossly unfair on a technicality to stop uh, a young chap like Connor uh, getting his family home in the countryside. Thank you, Mr. Casty. Okay, members, any further questions? Why we have representation available here? Okay, members. Uh, in that case, I'd, I'd thank um, thank the agent and supporter, and I now invite. Uh, councillors Barry McAlduff and Bert Wilson. Uh, there's five minutes allocated for this um, slot, so I'd ask the councillors to um, agree amongst themselves and, and to go ahead in their own time. Right, right, Barry, away you go. Okay, thanks, Bert. That's great. Um, Chair, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present on this. I want to speak in support of uh, Connor Daly's application uh, for this uh, dwelling and dom domestic garage. And I know, as a, I know the applicant and his family very well from a local point of view, and the house the dwelling is absolutely needed. 
Um, it's on family land. There's no speculation going on here whatsoever. Um, Connor himself spoke very well there when he detailed his strong local family and community connections. His child going to primary school in September locally, etc. And I know as a, a local person, Connor himself, uh, to have worked the land, you know, throughout his life uh, with his family. So I'm familiar with the site and reading the notes, you know, um, delighted that it achieves integration. Uh, it's consistent with rural character, access from existing lane, visual link with established group, um, no objections from any of the statutory or significant consultees. So really, to conclude my contribution, I'll say this. I'm satisfied that this land, from my local knowledge, is being maintained in good agriculture and environmental condition. There's no doubt about that. And it does constitute an active and established farm business for well over six years. And I, I think Chris outlined it very well. The additional evidence and information that has been provided uh, is substantive and significant, you know, by way of receipts and invoices and investment in the farm uh, over the past period. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak. Over now to Councillor Wilson. Chair, yes. Well, this farm that we are, uh, that the applicant is uh, planning to build on uh, was his father's farm and the family farm down over the years. Uh, no farm or no site was ever sold off the farm. And the overriding reason uh, for uh, the young man to look for the dwelling uh, in the country uh, it's, it's essential in the rural areas and it's uh, to be in close proximity with his father and his family members. So in years to come, he'll be able to hopefully help his parents uh, to, along the line. Uh, saying is not, that is not an active farm is not actually correct. The farm is active and the owner does maintain the property, uh, but as an aged parent, uh, person, uh, he does it only with part-time assist, uh, assistance from other family members. He has paid a contractor to cut hedges, make hay, and also carry out uh, an extensive uh, fencing uh, project. And there are seats for the work at these and for the uh, fencing I have been supplied to the planners, in, uh, so they should have those. Uh, this site is, uh, is also a site that fits into the rural countryside. It is not visible from anywhere and uh, will integrate and blend into the rural area. Uh, the, uh, there is evidence uh, as well as purchase uh, for fertilizer on the uh, posts and all for the fencing that I uh, mentioned uh, uh, earlier. So I, I believe that, yes, there is, uh, maybe planners do have a problem, but this uh, young man is coming home here to his home farm that has been there in the family for generations and uh, is intent on living there and assisting his parents on that farm. So I would recommend that uh, planners really revisit this and that the councillors take it, these things into account when making, up their de making their decision. And I would recommend uh, an approval for the site. So thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, councillors. You've kept within the allocated time frame. Um, I now maybe ask our Planning officer, if he wishes to make any comment at this stage. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, uh, just to advise members that uh, planners don't have a problem with the policy. Uh, the policy is there in black and white, and everybody can interpret it the way they feel feel best. The critical thing, again, similar to the last application, members, it's all about evidence, uh, and it's for you to determine the level of evidence that has been submitted. Uh, that's clearly set out in the report, uh, and you'll see then on on page uh, five. Uh, it uh, goes through and lists you the invoices which have been provided from 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18 and 20. Uh, and when you go through that, the evidence is limited uh, in scale and degree to uh, you know, maybe three businesses. Uh, for example, in 2017, there was four hours spreading slurry uh, and then hire of a machine to dig foundations for stables. So it's the evidence that's being presented to you. Officer's view is that it doesn't demonstrate for six years that the applicant has been maintaining the land in good environmental condition. In relation to the appeal statement that the, the agent refers to, 
I note from the, the statement and the decision of the Commissioner then that the, the appellant submitted invoices for cutting and round baling, invoices for grass topping, invoices for cutting hedgerows, invoices for spreading slurry over the years. Uh, there are a lot of comments made in the speaking rights about cutting silage annually. You know, I, I, there's no information or evidence of how that's done or who does that or who is a machine, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, this is all down to evidence that's being provided in support of the application. Uh, and as I say, in this case, based on the evidence and the information that's with planners, uh, we wouldn't say that it, uh, it demonstrates there's an active and established farm holding for at least the six years. In terms then of the, the property that's been transferred off, that's set out in the report members that uh, it was transferred off at the date. Uh, and uh, Barry has now joined the farm business. And uh, officers view is that it's, it's still contrary to the policy, even though he has now joined the farm, farm business. Okay, members, uh, opportunity for any questions you might have for our planning officer at this point or any comments? Councillor Leighton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I really want to, to tease out a little bit more um, the, the, the development opportunity that has, uh, according to um, the planning officer has been sold off within the past um, uh, number of years. Um, we heard from Mr. Cassidy uh, that planning approval uh, for uh, uh, the dwelling was uh, was obtained in 2002, uh, which was six years prior to the cur current planning legislation, that the house was built uh, by Barry uh, Daly. Uh, uh, but that uh, officially, due to a technicality, uh, that the transfer was not completed on till 2014, uh, but that the house had been substantially uh, completed prior to that, and that there was never a sale uh, uh, to start with, you know, that no money exchanged hands, because Barry was a family member, and he is now a full member of the farm business. Um, so, um, I just wondered if I could have uh, Barry's comments on that, uh, please. It seems to me that, um, you know, it would be a pity if, uh, because of undue delays in actually completing the legal processes that this, uh, planning application, uh, could, could be refused. So just uh, to have the planning officers, uh, comments on that chair. Yes. Uh... Councillor, certainly in terms of the, the development opportunity has been transferred off, the definition of a transfer under the uh, policy uh, doesn't require the money to exchange hands, so it can be a transfer within the family. The critical question is, has it gone off the farm business? And that's the question for members to determine today. Has it gone from the farm business to a, another person outside of the farm business? At the time, the transfer clearly was, um, because it was only one person listed on the farm business, and now that person has joined the farm business. 2012. So that's for members really to decide how they how they respond to that. In terms of the delay in that, um, well, the the date of the transfer is is given as the date of land registry transfer because that's a that's a date that everybody can fall back on and rely on then. And that was 2014. There may have been a delay in transferring it over, but that is the date that's before members today. Sorry, chair. Just a, supp a supplementary, please, if I may. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, my understanding from the information that has been uh, presented by the agent uh, and and uh, this, the um, uh, people who have spoken to us about this planning application is that both uh, 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 Barry and Connor uh, have been very active uh, in supporting uh, their father with the farm business over the years. Uh, and uh you know because of that then uh they, they they could be regarded as being active members of this farm business because they do assist uh in the running of the farm and in the maintenance of the farm and connor even referred to a time when uh, they worked with ostrich uh, farming uh, in which he himself played a key role Again, remember, sorry to sound like a broken record, but this is evidence. Um, you know, if there's evidence to support all of this information, that's fine. 
um, and that you know that can be presented and, and try and, and defend the cases being presented. But I don't have any evidence of any ostrich farming. Any comment on Connor's role in the business? The only evidence I have is the receipts that have been presented, and then the comment from Dara that uh, he joined the farm business there in 2012. Thanks, Lord Gardy. Um, thanks, Chair. And it's, maybe it's more of a comment than a question at this stage, but I suppose I'm looking at this as if we were looking at this in 100 years' time, and Darren's quite right. We'd be looking at dates and uh, what the archives would present to us and, and, and what we were you know, looking up. The beauty of today is that it's not in 100 years' time, and I think we've had testaments from local reps, um, Councillor Barry McElduff and, and Bert Wilson, and indeed the family, and we all know and have no read, need to judge or, or, or doubt this family, that they are that family and that have been on this farm for years. Therefore, our determination of how we interpret what has happened may be different. And I think we all know that in families that often do build houses, sometimes there can be a delay in paperwork, which is regrettable. Um, but I suppose my point is, Chair, is that I think we know today that that's a genuine situation as opposed to if we were looking at it many years down the line, we mightn't have the representation um, or, or the real credible evidence to know that we can stand over that. But so it's just more of a comment and, uh, that I'm making at this stage, Chair. Any members, any further <clears throat> questions for the officer or comments? Councillor McGuire. Thank you, Margaret. Then uh, a difficult one, as, as as we're all aware, with the lack of evidence. Uh, similar to a previous article we've dealt with this afternoon, where evidence was required and a deferral was was recommended, uh, and I reluctantly supported that. But uh, again, as, as Councillor Gardy has said, like we cannot ignore the honest submissions of our local councillors who know the family and are, have given testament. Now, it's difficult for us to make the recommend or to uh, make the decision on that evidence alone. Uh, so, uh, again, would it, would it be, well, again, I'm going to make a proposal that we would defer this, and uh, apologies with it, but uh, again, uh, given that we've already considered not enough evidence being a good enough reason. I think uh, a deferral for a month or so to allow these uh, the applicant uh, and and uh, I I can't believe that they can't find more evidence and maybe the, the depth of evidence that they submitted they believed was good enough uh, and obviously from this discussion we would need slightly more. So I, I'd be hopeful that the applicants can find some more evidence and I'd be happy to propose a deferral for a month, Chair. Councillor and Councillor Deacon. Well, thank you, Chair. And I, I want to second uh, Councillor Maguire's uh, proposal to defer to allow additional information to be uh, submitted. This, uh, uh, I was very impressed uh, uh, by the testimony of Mr. Connor Daly, and I have no doubt that it would be his dream uh, to live in a house uh, built on the family farm where he uh, grew up on. So uh, it would be uh, um, regrettable indeed if this planning application was refused uh, for the want of uh, supporting evidence. Uh, so uh, the applicant and his agent will have heard the debate in the chamber this afternoon and, and, and the sort of evidence that is required uh, to support uh, uh, the contention that this is an active farm business and has been active over the past six years. And secondly, uh, that there actually has not been any uh, uh, transfer of an asset out of the farm business uh, within the last 10 years. So on that basis, I, I want to support Councillor Maguire's proposal for a deferral. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Rainey. Well, Chair, I just uh, I want to support uh, the councillor and uh, councillor Deacon for a second. I have listened to the agent and uh, those who have spoken in support of it, and I honestly feel that there's enough of evidence there to support this application, and I I want it to uh, to be thoroughly examined. Uh, 
for to come back to us for further consideration. Thanks, Irving. Thanks very much, Chair. I, I find myself in um, the area of reluctance. I think as some of the councils were previously to one of the other applications. Uh, I agree. There's a lack of evidence here. Um, I, I reluctantly agree to a deferral for uh, a stated period of time, I think, as was in the previous one. Uh, but I would draw attention to the applicant and the agent, the second recommendation for refusal, uh, in that at the moment there's insufficient evidence already provided by either the applicant or the agent, in my opinion, to actually overcome the policy issue sitting there. As much as we would go with sentiment, sentiment should not be taken into account when we reach a determination, unfortunately. We have to look at policy, and if there's an exception to the policy, we have to see if an application uh, falls under the remit of uh, an exception to the policy. At the moment, I doubt if uh, this application would fall under an exception to the policy in regard to the 10-year rule, but I will await to see what information the applicant and the agent put in uh, during the referral process to actually rebut that recommendation for refusal. Thank you. Okay, members, we have a proposal to defer the application by Councillor McGuire, seconded by Councillor Deacon. Um, is all members in agreement with that? Councillor Gardy, you wanted in just at this point? Yes, thank you. And apologies, Chair, and agreed with, with your question from my point of view. But I suppose um, as we as members are not able to communicate with families or agents or one thing or another, I don't know if there would be lays with Darren. The, uh, the problem that I outlined that Councillor Irvin rightly put out the 10 year rule, this is something that is genuinely getting a date that's not accurate in our system. And I wonder if maybe the agent will contact Darren and whether it's, you know, um, photographic evidence in, in 20, 2006 with a supporting letter or guide them on how that could be, you know, I understand Darren's position and they can only go with what's in the land registry, but um, we know that what's there isn't actually factual. And as I say, I can't go um, to anyone and say what I believe you might need to have a support and evidence. And because this is such a complicated one and one of the rules is nearly black and white within the planning, yeah, the rest of them are very grey, but and we know in rural from Ananoma, this happens all the time with families. And so we have to have a way that families can get um, a thought of it around this and prove that what they're saying is true, but in the documentation, um, um, it, it don't, doesn't necessarily reflect that and makes us all study history and what we read and what we follow. And as a good, as I often say, only believe, you know, uh, believe nothing you see in half of what you read and you're flying. So there we go. Thanks, Chair. Okay, members, um, no further comments. I think we're all in agreement that be deferred. And in terms of the period of time, are we seeing one month? Okay. And that is um, delegated to officers. Yeah, if you want, yeah. Is that right? Delegated back to officers. We're happy enough with that. Yeah. And uh, I just asked Darren to sum up. Thank you, members. Uh, okay, members. So the recommendation then was to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to three reasons. Uh, members have gone contrary to the recommendation uh, and have decided to uh, delegate the application back to officers um, and uh, to allow the agent to submit more information in support of the two reasons for refusal, uh, namely the farm business uh, and evidence in relation to the development opportunity uh, that has been transferred. That has to be submitted within one month. Okay, thank you, members. At this point, I'm going to have a brief comfort break if that's okay um so maybe what time do you say to come back at maybe i should decide that but uh, i would imagine 10 minutes would be suffice we just quarter two keep it tight no problem
Mm-hmm. Hold on, Grandpa. <laughs> you okay? No.
0743F, and that's the conversion of dwelling to two self contained flats. Okay, remember, so uh, application 8, uh, LA 10 2020 0743. It's a full application for the conversion of a dwelling to two self contained flats uh, in Ashfield Gardens and Fintna, and uh, the applicant then is Thomas Armstrong. The recommendation then is to refuse planning permission. Uh, you'll note from the report, members, that the application was before you previously. Uh, and amended plans have been submitted, uh, changing the proposal, and I'll go through those and just remind you what was applied for previously. So the recommendation then is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report uh, and is subject to one reason. So you recall, members, the location of the uh, site is within Ashfield uh, in Fintna, Ashfield Gardens in Fintna, and the site then is identified by the red rectangle on the screen uh, within the wider development. And that's just its location in terms of the proximity to the main street of Fintna. So it's over there in the left with the yellow star. Uh, again, then the property is a mid property terrace uh, within a terrace of four units. And uh, it's the second one in from the right hand side. The front of the property then faces out onto a pedestrian alleyway, uh, as you can see in the right hand slide with the purple arrow, then the front garden. The property then is number 38. And then the rear is a rear enclosed yard, which backs onto a, a large car parking area. So that's the proposal in the block plan then. You can see the property fronts onto the footpath with the car parking area at the rear uh, and access to the rear yard. Aerial photograph then, just again showing you the location uh, and its uh, position relative to the other properties. But, uh, you'll note then it's, it's the front of the property looks out onto the pedestrian um, path. Uh, it also looks out then over the rear gardens of the terrace, which is 90 degrees to our site. So the proposal, uh, the existing plans then, you have uh, the ground floor access uh, from the front, as shown on the screen, and you also then have a ground floor access at the rear. You then go up the stairs, and there are four bedrooms and the bathroom, as you can see in the right-hand slide. And that's the front elevation of the property at the moment. And then the rear elevation. So the proposal previously members was for the change of use of the building and uh, the downstairs be converted to a one bedroom flat with access to the front and rear and then the upstairs was converted into a two bedroom unit uh, with a kitchen and living room, up, living room upstairs. Access to the upstairs unit was via the external stairs uh, as you can see on the slide and uh, the, that was shown in the rear elevation uh, showing the external steps. Uh, that was as they presented to members previously uh, and the amended plans was deferred to enable further discussions between the agent and officers in relation to the proposal. Amended plans have been submitted now and these are the amended drawings come in on the 2nd of June. Uh, these show the front elevation of the property. You can see now the applicant is proposing to just go back to the front elevation. You can see at the moment there's a, a doorway into the property in a slight recessed area with a window to the left and then two windows upstairs. And what they're proposing now is to keep the windows as they are and the door will be retained as it is, but a new doorway will be uh, created to the side of the existing doorway to allow a separate access then internally up to the flats. The rear elevation will not change, so the external staircase at the back has been removed, which considerably improves the appearance of the development. So there's no changes to the rear elevation. So as a ground floor, you'll now have two doors on the front of the property. Um, there'll be the existing doorway into the porch area and into a hall, accessing the living room at the front, the bedroom at the back, and the kitchen at the back, with a rear access out through the porch to the rear yard. To the right-hand side of the existing doorway, a new doorway will be created, and that will go through, and then there'll be stairs up to the second, to the first floor, which is the second unit. And you'll come up the stairs, there'll be an, a large landing area with a storage area, you have a kitchen, bathroom, and then bedroom one, and the living room. Um, so, members, you'll note from the report, the site's in an established residential area um, where the pattern of development is of two-storey dwellings. The existing property is a four-bedroom house. Um, evidence has been submitted that it's difficult to rent the property out, and the demand is from smaller one- and two-bedroom properties. And this evidence has come in from the estate agents, um, which is noted on the report. However, the change of use will not create a quality residential development as it will have an adverse effect on the local character and environmental quality of the surrounding area and set an undesirable precedent. It will also adversely impact on the residential immunity of nearby third parties from overlooking as the upstairs flat 
uh, has a living room facing out to the front, which overlooks the rear garden or the rear amenity areas of the adjacent properties. Um, so the, uh, it will adversely impact residential amenity of nearby third parties from overlooking the loss of amenity. And uh, in addition, the original property being converted is less than 150 square meters gross internal floor space, which is the minimum size within the policy for buildings to be converted. The existing building is around 111 square meters and it needs to be 150 to meet the policy tests for conversion from a single unit to flats or apartments. So you can see there the reason for refusal, A, adverse impact on local character um, and uh, of the environment quality of the surrounding area. Uh, there's an additional issue in terms of the bin storage in that the upstairs flat only has an access out to the front of the property. It has no access to the rear and therefore any bins or any for the upstairs flat uh, are going to have to be stored in the front of the property. Uh, they, they do not have access to the rear. If they want to get access to the rear, they have to walk out the front and around the adjacent property, down the alleyway and then round to the rear of the property, which is considered to be unreasonable. Um, B, then, it would have an adverse impact, uh, an adverse effect on local character and environmental quality of the surrounding area by creating an undesirable precedent uh, because there are a number of properties in the area. They are all uh, four bedroom properties, largely, uh, and uh, this would set a precedent. It will adversely impact on the residential immediate nearby third parties when they overlooking the loss of immunity. And as I say, the original property is less than 150 square meters gross internal floor space and only around 111. Okay, members. At this point, if we have any questions for the officer here. Councillor Irvine. Chair, um, Darren, could you bring up the photographs, I think, of the building as present? That's the front elevation there. Yeah. And that's the rear elevation. Right. Could you go back to the front elevation? I just want to look a little bit more. Right, that's okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments at this point? Councillor O'Reilly? Chair, sure, just can Darren remind me uh, when this was with us before? And to my mind, it is quite some time ago that it was here. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, while we need to try and get as much evidence to give everybody as uh, fair an opportunity to present the case as possible, I'm concerned that, uh, you know, when they are presented originally, that we leave that time as, as um, short as possible in order that we are you able to expedite business and get business on through? Uh, so the um, application was first, um, it was deferred at the December meeting, so it's last December, uh, for one month, uh, and then it was deferred again in January to allow discussions between the agent and officers in relation to the proposal. Those have been ongoing uh, and uh, they have taken longer than anticipated. Um, I have to put my hand up and say largely because of my fault and that I've just been busy on other work, so I haven't given it as detailed consideration, so it's not necessarily the agent's fault. Uh, he had submitted a, an initial scheme, and this is his second revision to it, so there have been discussions ongoing in the background. They've just unfortunately taken longer, but he has worked with the council officers. Hey, Councillor Deacon. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Darren, for your report. Um, I remember uh, this planning application very well, and when it first came before committee, it was wholly unacceptable. And uh, one of the uh, uh, major concerns we had was the external stairway, which has now been uh, removed. Um, I suppose uh, uh, initially the, the proposal was for a two bedroom, wasn't it for a two bedroom flat above? Now it's, it's, it's one flat. Um, the overlooking issue, would that not have been uh, the case uh, with the existing property, albeit it would have been a bedroom rather than a living room? 
and 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 chair would it would it uh, if you revert if you made the living room into a bedroom and and then the 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 smaller bedroom area into a living room would that have a, a positive impact on the overlooking issue and then secondly in terms of um uh, housing uh, the bins uh, would it be possible to have a little um uh, storage area to the front of the building. I mean, that's not uncommon uh, in modern developments that you would have even to the front of modern buildings, a little wooded, wooden slatted area where you would have been store, stored uh, and it could be quite discreet. Uh, the, the main stumbling point, I suppose, would be, be the, the size of the development. Uh, and I don't know, could that be enhanced by, uh, you know, um, adding a balcony or something to the rear. I I'm just wondering, is there any way around this? Because I think the applicant has taken on board the concerns that we had and has made a good effort to accommodate, uh, you know, what our requirements would be. Uh, if my recollection is correct, um, the, the, the applicant and the agent made a strong point for uh, you know, smaller units of accommodation, one bedroom units, uh, and, and he's providing that in this location. So, Chair, I just wish uh, uh, it would be grateful if Darren would clarify those issues. Thank you. Certainly. Um, so, that, that information that was previously uh, raised at the committee meeting in January, that is all relevant to today and is material, and the information and support pre presented by the applicant. Uh, uh, is all relevant and to be taken into account today. So you can it's a case of balancing this all up, uh, as with all planning applications. There was a case being made previously that there's no demand for the four bed units and he's having the difficulty renting that out and he wants the smaller units. That has to be balanced against the consequences and the impacts of the development, uh, plus the concerns officers have over the, the precedent that this would set. If we go through the various issues that, that, um, that are, are, are arising from the development, and the policy sets the limit of 150 square meters uh, for the existing building to be converted. It's not the size of the new building. So um, buildings to be converted uh, must be a minimum of 150. Uh, we're, we're at about 111. So if it was 140 something, you know, there's, a, there's obviously flexibility there and, and common sense approach, but there's a significant shortfall there, which officers have significant difficulty uh, overcoming. In terms of the, the bins, uh, yes, there are examples of where that's done appropriately and, uh, you know, there's a nice uh, bin storage area created out the front. If that was the only issue, then certainly we could go back and negotiate further with the applicant on that and see what could be done. But at this stage, uh, there are so many other issues that I don't think really there's, uh, it's appropriate to defer to go back and try and resolve that. Uh, in terms of the, the overlooking, the, the upstairs then is on the screen, so you can see that's the first floor. Um, and it's critical, the internal layout is obviously the key thing here. Previously, it was a bedroom. Now, reasonably, a person standing in their bedroom doesn't stay for long looking out the window. Uh, when it's a living room, it's different. Uh, they're sitting on a, on a sofa or a, t a seat uh, for prolonged periods of time, and there is ample opportunity for overlooking out that window. The view is in out of the window. We just get the plan. So you can see then there's the property with the yellow star uh, and the orientation end of that window is in the direction of the purple arrow. So you're looking out that window and you're looking down the rear elevations of all of that terrace beside you. So in terms of this particular property, it's particularly bad in that it has direct views down that terrace. Um, at the moment, the bedroom window, yes, you may stand there for a short period of time, but it's not going to be a prolonged period of time. With well, the living room, living room window now looking down there, it's not something that a new development would be approved. Uh, and certainly for the conversion, uh, the same issues apply in that you can look down into those amenity spaces. At the moment, they are fairly well enclosed by large fences, and there is limited overlooking of them from anywhere else. Um, uh, and as I say, it's the precedent as well, members. Um, obviously, uh, the information provided in support of the application previously about renting the units out is an important material consideration but this will set a precedent for the first one in the area and it's how then we would we would respond to that if more applications come in and suddenly the development and the site is turned into uh, a development all of one and two bed apartments 
Chair, may I ask a supplementary, please? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I mean, if, if we're talking about the floor space of the original dwelling uh, before it was converted, I mean, surely, um, you know, that fact should have been pointed out to the applicant at the, uh, at the outset, because it would seem to me then that there was no way he was going to get around uh, the, the, the area of the original uh, building. I must say, I thought it was the size of the uh, renovated building. And I had thought that maybe if you were to put the, 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 the bedroom uh, where the living room is on the top uh, flat and then maybe the, the living room to the rear and maybe put a little balcony or something uh, to the rear of the building, you know, that someone could sit out mm -hmm. or, or put plants or something out there. So is, is that a starter or not a starter? Uh, well, the, the, the policy test is 150 of the existing building. Um, that's set out in the policy and it's very clear in the policy and it's a long-standing policy. It's been out for some considerable time. Uh, I don't know whether the agent was aware of it when he made the application or not. Uh, I don't know that, but certainly in terms of planning officers, we're aware of that. Um, and it was raised at the last meeting. I think one of the councillors I see pointed it out. It's going to be difficult to overcome that. Uh, so there, in terms of changing the internal layout to reduce the overlooking, um, when you start to introduce balconies and things and properly, I guess, properties, I guess it gets very difficult because you're then putting a balcony in the rear terrace, which allows you to come out from your property and then look in the windows of the buildings next door. So it generates more problems and difficulties there and neighbours may not want that. So those sorts of things, yes, would be something that you could tease out if there was no other issues. But as they given the cumulative issues here, it's very difficult uh, to, to, to overcome those. Councillor Irving. Thanks very much. Um, Darren, you've, you've answered a query I had in the back of my mind in regard to 1D. It's a fundamental issue and there would be a complete departure from the policy if we were to um, find an exception going down from 150 square metres to 111. That's practically 33% reduction in internal floor space area and it just it doesn't work. Um, I think the intimation coming from the agent um, on behalf of the applicant at the previous submission to the committee was he wanted to do as little as possible to the walls of the existing dwelling. He wanted to work within the walls of the dwelling uh, and that's where everything goes. That's fine and dandy, but we don't have the internal space to do that. Um, he may wish to consider um, coming back with an extension to the rear to try and do something and then create his flats. But at the moment, working within the existing wall, it's not going to work. So I'm sorry, I would like to help, but I think you're right. Fundamentally, 1D is a problem that we won't overcome. And um, I think 1A has to be significantly uh, looked at it as well. Um, it's a three to four bedroom uh, dwelling. People still need them. And yes, there is a demand for flats, but there's also a huge demand for bungalows. Um, can't get them whatsoever, so we have to think about that. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think on the balance of it, I'm going to propose that we go with your recommendation and refuse. I think fundamentally the applicant and the agent need to see what they can do that will work within the policy. And I think it needs a pad again to see what can be done with the property, not just bung an application in and hope for the best. So it's unfortunate, but um, we have to take this on board on the chin. So that's my recommendation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I remember this at the, I was Thomas Alfred last December and I was one of the councillors that um, thought them stairs up the back was, was way looking and um, and I didn't really agree with this at all. But I was just wondering, Rob, we got the the folks back up there. Would you would you have even enough room for two front doors there in between the other house and the window? Like, I think that he's trying to do it, and it's really not possible. So, no, I'd be kind of inclined to agree with Robert there as well, and and um, just leave it as the way it is. And it's trying to do more changes that Josephine was indicating there. Like, it's just kind of hoping to be third time lucky and try again, you know. No, so. I'd, I'd reluctantly to it, I'd, I'd, I'd second um, the proposal. Councillor 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, Darren, you couldn't bring up the, the, the... I haven't obviously seen this one before. Um, I have a vague memories of Icefield Gardens. The parking is to the rear, as far as I can remember. So the upstairs flat would, as well as having to go all the way around for their bin, they would be parking at the back of the property. And then that's a mid-terrace. So they're, they're going one way or the other up alleyways to, to try and get round as well. So, I mean, the front door was a panel, as far as I can remember, in those houses, a double panel, and the stairs was directly in front of it. So they're just going to box off and bring the front door forward. Is that, that what they're suggesting to do? And that makes them a corridor to access the stairs, to go straight up to the upstairs? Yeah, so just in relation to the, the parking, first of all, yeah, the parking for this uh, house is at the rear. Uh, and then there's the access and you can see the double gates then into the rear of the property. Uh, you could park there and then walk down the alleyway to the property. Uh, and it's only a short distance. It's not a, a major issue. So we wouldn't have any difficulty with the parking being at the rear. Uh, and it wouldn't be any reason for refusal. No, no, no policy objections there. The difficulty is, as you said, the bins. Uh, you have to come out your front door and then walk down the alleyway around number 37 and then into your rear garden and back again. So in terms then of the the, the development, the works that are going to be carried out. So at the moment, uh, on the left, you can see that's the existing plans. So the ground floor, you have a porch area uh, and there's a doorway into the dwelling, a toilet on the right, and then a small hall. There's a small store area just to the right of the porch. You can see the door there. Mm -hmm. So if we go on then, to, and that's the elevation. So front of the basin, they're all very similar, these properties. And then go on to the the proposed works. Let me get the drawing. Yeah, so that's the ground floor plan now then. So the doorway is staying in its original position uh, and you can see the porch is staying as well but there will now be a subdivision with a wall created and a new doorway then on the right hand side of the wall the sort of hatched uh, uh, lines on the drawing are the proposed walls and proposed works that are going to be carried out the bold is the existing walls so you can see there there's a, a new doorway coming in on the right hand side of the existing porch and there'll be a small area there then straight up the stairs uh, and then up into the top floor and you can see that there so you come up the stairs into a landing area uh, with the living room on the left bedroom at the back and kitchen at the back and i say no changes to any of the walls up there other than the kitchen wall beside the stairs there's a new wall going in there to, uh, to replace the other wall so you'd have two bedrooms on either side and now you'll have a kitchen and landing on the right and bedroom on the left and la living room on the left Okay, thank you. I go to Margaret then. I'll just uh, just to state the the one D that uh, fact that the building is is as low as one hundred and eleven square meters. I think we have to be consider that the the two flats would not be of adequate size because we must be conscious of the the tenants. Of these flats and i'm sure as councillors we would be getting it very hard pressed to justify squeezing whatever number of people into a flat that is so way below the basic standard so it's their living accommodation would not be adequate in my opinion so i think that's another supplementary reason and yeah. to me uh, i'll note your comments uh Councillor. i just refer you to the report that the critical issue here it's the size of the original property is 150 there are minimum space standards for the sizes of the new flats, um, and that's guidance. So it's not a it's not a, a def definite number. Um, the guidance says that the one bed flat should be thirty five to fifty five square meters. Um, and both of the flats would be around fifty eight, so they're just slightly over what would be a, a, the guidance for a one bed flat. Um, so therefore, officers' view would be that they are. Yes, they're small, but in terms of the guidance notes and the advice that the council has, they meet that. So it's not the size of the flats is the problem. It's the size of the original building. Apologies for that, and thanks for that information, Darren. That's very useful. But uh, uh, given the figures previous, I thought that was the consideration. But uh, apologies for that. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for that, Councillor. I was going to ask for just clarity on that, and it was around the guidance, around the 150. But you're saying, Darren, that that 150 square metres isn't it's, guidance. It's policy. Uh, but it, it's almost a, a conflict that you would have that policy and then another one which could be could be met within that size of a property yeah 
which is what happened here. The, 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 the flats do meet the, the gay lanes. Yeah, so the, the, the critical issue, you think, is that it's the principle of the conversion is the first test. To, you know, are we going to permit that? And that's where they're looking at the size of the building and the policy saying, well, you shouldn't be allowed to you know, convert small buildings into apartments. It should be a building of some size and structure. Uh, unless there's some other reason why you go below that number. For example, if it was a listed building and it was to keep its upkeep or something like that, or there was some other material consideration which you could fall back on and say go below the 150. But where you have a building in the middle of a terrace, which is in a wider housing development, full of houses that are identical, it's very difficult to, to set that policy aside. Okay, members, no further questions for the officer. Um, we have a proposal by Councillor Irving, and it's been seconded by Councillor Feely. Uh, is everyone in agreement with that proposal? Okay, turn. Okay, members, so uh, application LA 10 20 20 The recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report. And subject to one reason, members have refused the application in accordance with that reason. Okay, members, so item seven on our agenda is to note the schedule of planning decisions issued in June 2021. That's paper D. We have a, sorry. Okay, members. Um so paper D, um, I don't have any um, specific comments on this, but I'm, I'm happy to, to take any, any members' questions on it. Um, I suppose what we're setting out here um, is the, the summary of the decisions issued. So um, you can see there, um, there were 142 plan decisions um, and they are detailed in Appendix 1 um, and 112 related to, to planning applications. Um, and then obviously the remainder related to the other um, types of applications that come before us, such as clubs and, and non-material changes. Um, so, in terms of the, the recommendation, it's to, it's to note the report. Thanks, Sir Irvine. Thank you, Chair. Happy to note the report. Thanks, Sir Robinson. Thank you, Okay, we're all in agreement. So, item eight then is to note the update report on planning enforcement in June 2021, paper E. Okay, thank you, Chair. So paper E again is an update um, on our planning enforcement activity um, during the month of June. <clears throat> and just to note that two notices were served um, during the month of June. Um, and in addition to that, then we've set out um, the caseload update, which is that 18 enforcement cases were closed and then three enforcement cases were opened. Um, and then that leaves us with a total of live enforcement files um, at the end of June as being 279. Um, and the details um, of the 18 cases that were closed um, are set out in, in the report. Um, and then the, the detail of the, the nine cases are also set out as well. So in terms of the recommendation, um, it's that Council note the report um, on the planning enforcement action in June 2021. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you to Sinead. Uh, I'm happy to propose the recommendation as listed to note. Thank you. And Councillor Irving. Thank you, Chair. Happy to second the proposal. Thank you. Okay, and they're all agreed with that. Uh, item 10 then is to. Sorry. Sorry. Just a wee question uh, before you go on. Can I get a, just a reminder, maybe from Darren or Sinead, um, what is our sort of target for getting a planning application out through the system? And do we have a target for uh, dealing with the um, enforcement cases as well? And how does that? And if we have cross border issues, is that something that just leaves us in a no man's land? Um, thank you, Councillor Riley. Um, I suppose what I would say is when I get to paper G, um, it's an update actually on our performance over the, the past year, and that'll take us through the performance target. But in terms of um, local applications, we have a 15-week statutory target 
Um, Leonard Majors, Majors is a 30 week statutory target. Um, and then in terms of our enforcement um, cases, um, it's 70% um, of, of cases concluded um, within 39 weeks. And Chair, why do we have a differential then between our planning um, permissions uh, allocated out and that we are going at a 70% uh, for the enforcement cases? So that leaves 30% of the enforcement cases that has no time fixed period on them. So the, the period for the, the planning applications is a is number of weeks. Yeah. Um, so 15 for local um, and 30 um, for majors. Mm -hmm. um, and then the enforcement um, is a slightly different target. It's, it's worded in a slightly different way in that it's 70% of cases to target conclusion within 39 weeks um, of, of us opening them. Just repeating it, Shinny, it isn't going to clarify it for me. <laughs> um, and and those, those, are, those are targets that are set down in the, the local government um, regulations. Um, so they're set there, I suppose, as a target for us to work to, to make sure that we are moving um, the applications and the enforcement um, through the, the system efficiently. Um, obviously, we also have our enforcement strategy, um, and that sets out the process then within which we would um, process our enforcement cases um, and we obviously have different priorities then in terms of enforcement cases within the enforcement strategy. Um, so for example, um, let's say it was a listed building, um, then that would become um, like a priority one type um, enforcement case um, and then we may have lesser um, priority cases um, depending on what's before us. So uh, Chair, if you just allow me because I'm confused and when I'm confused I just ask questions. Uh, so. Are we, am I taking this up right that you're saying to me that 70% uh, are issued, are targeted to be issued in 39 weeks? So what I'm trying to dig at here then is where's the other 30% and what's the time scale on that? My, I'm, I, and what prompts, and Darren is, is quietly yeah. uh, sitting on, on this because he knows why I'm prompting uh, this question because I, I'm led to believe that we have a case going back many, many, many years. And I'm just wondering how many, many years of cases are sitting on the books? And is that the 30% that covers all of those many years? And what policy do we, or what strategy do we have? Or is it if it is a kit, a cross border thing, and you can't just do it, it just sits there until, until you do that? So I'm just trying to get a little bit of an understanding of where that all works out. Maybe a second Sinead. The, the enforcement target is a different target from planning applications. And the enforcement target basically is if you have 100 files in that month and you've concluded them, you have to have over 70% concluded within the 39 weeks. So you just list them all in order and it works out the percentage for you. In terms of the um, um, older files, that's set out in the, in the report and you'll see that all. And there are a number of files that are over the 39 weeks, there are files that are there for some significant period of time. And they have been kicking about, if you use that expression, for a long time. Enforcement is notoriously slow. Legal action is particularly difficult and challenging, and getting a file to the courts uh, is, is can take a long, long time. Um, but if there are particular cases that need to go as a priority, certainly, and those are raised with us, we get them to the front of the queue and they are taken on. So hopefully that helps. I could just comment. I think the seventy percent maybe recognises that uh, a differential between enforcement cases that might be more straightforward, although none of them are particularly straightforward. But thirty percent recognises that a number of them will fall within the legal system and to some extent will be outside our control. So once the legal system kicks in uh, for some of these, they are going to take longer, and that I think is why the department has introduced a slightly different approach to that enforcement target um, for the other uh, applications, or the application process and targets. Not sure if that helps, but. No, Chair, yes, you know, it does. I'm, I'm was just ferreting at that for the, for the one that is there. And I presume then that, you know, there is ones that will just sit there until something new comes in that we can do something about. It wasn't that I was sort of targeting that they, that the officers weren't in. I was just trying to understand how that sort of system worked. Thank you.
Okay, thank you each of the others for clarity there, Councillor Irving. Yeah, I'm not coming in in support of Councillor Riley. He's well capable of looking after himself um, of old. But I think it may be useful for some members if, and it's not a statutory requirement, but it may be useful, I think, for ourselves as well as members, that the cases that have a longer duration may need to be noted, um, inception and completion. Because what we're, we're actually seeing is new and closed, and it's a rolling total. And I understand why there's a statutory requirement from the department that those ones you close, you close within, you know, a percentage you close within a time so that you're actually actively working. But I know within the system there may be upwards of 15 to 20 cases that are going on in excess of two to three years. It may be useful then if at some stage, I'm not saying every quarter, but maybe on a yearly basis, that if we could get a report on older cases and just maybe a synopsis of them, because 80, 90 percent, 90 percent of cases you deal with on a rolling basis, it's a long run. So maybe that may help, but I would put that to officers. If they could do that on a yearly basis, it may be helpful to the committee. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, members. Um, so now item 10, sorry, item 9 is to note the quarterly update on live planning case. Load the board, paper F. Happy to note, um, Chair. You allowed Happy me in this chair. red there straight away. Thanks, Chairman. I'm Councillor Coyne. And item 10 then is to consider the planning performance annual statistics report for April 2020 to March 2021, and that's paper G. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this um, is a paper for members to note, and it provides an overview um, of our planning performance against the three statutory performance targets that we've, we've just discussed um, for the period of 2021. And attached to the report um, then are the, the reports and the detailed tables that would have been published by DFI, um, and which are also publicly available on the, the uh, DFI website. Um, so, by way of summary, um, I suppose it's firstly important just to highlight um, the comments um, that have actually been made in the DFI statistical bulletin um, in regard to COVID impacts. And they actually state on that that overall processing performance was impacted considerably by the restrictions and therefore caution should be taken when interpreting these figures and when making comparison with other time periods. Um, and I think we would all um, recognise that the COVID obviously has made it particularly difficult. Um, but in saying that, um, when you look at our figures in comparison um, to the Northern Ireland average um, and in comparison to what we're um, being asked to, to perform to in terms of the statutory target, um, the Council is still performing well. Um, and that's really in recognition, I suppose, of the, the positive um, reaction um, of the planning department and the wider support of the Council in terms of keeping the planning service moving and providing that planning service to, to our constituents. So although we've not met our performance target, during the period. Um, it is, as, as I say, important just to note um, the impact um, of COVID um, and to note that we still do perform well um, in the context of the Northern Ireland average. Um, it's also notable that we have had an increase in applications received over the year. Um, so when you compare this year with the previous year, we've actually had an increase of 85 more applications than in the previous year. And if you look specifically um, at paragraphs 2.5 and 2.6 of the report, uh, we just set out there in some detail um, the types of applications um, and where those increases um, have happened. So, for example, if you look at paragraph 2.6 of the report, um, you'll note that um, the most notable increase is the number of residential applications, which was um, 802 um, in the last year compared to 648 um, in the 2019-20 period. Um, at paragraph 2.9 um, as well, um, I just want to note that there's a, there's a small typo there. Um, where we're saying that we have on the 31st of March, we had 27 live um, enforcement files. That should actually say 277 um, live enforcement files. So just to, to note that. Um, it's also important to note um, that we carry out, um, of course, a number of other um, functions in terms of processing files that are, I suppose, not, um, they're not time scaled in terms of a statutory performance target. Um, and for example, we have our clubs, uh, we have our, um, 
minor um, amendment type um, applications and we have pads um, and I just wanted to focus in on the pad and spe specifically because we actually are the second um, highest number um, of pads in terms of the council performance across Northern Ireland and I suppose that just reflects our drive and um, our willingness and, and desire um, to encourage applicants and agents to submit um, I suppose better quality applications and to front load them um, and maybe not to get into maybe the situations that we find ourselves in where we, we're having to defer applications. So we just wanted to, to focus in on that specifically. Um, and then in terms of the, the recommendation of the report, um, it's at Council note the report on the planning performance statistical report. Okay, Councillor Jerry. Thanks very much, Chair, and um, thank you, Sinead. We all know there's been a challenge in the year, but I think we've handled ourselves quite well. And it's true what you say, both from your end of um, the scheme and ourselves as a planning committee and indeed the wider council body. We have um, tried to drive this on as best we can. From the start, we've been saying that, you know, architects, agents want back out, the people want out. If we had, we were conscious of them behind it all. Often we're very critical of them and to get things moving. I think we were the first council to set up um, out of the 11, remember, remember being that my last chair, maybe one. Um, so we have done great work and, and a thanks to yourselves and the officers and us as a committee. So uh, although there might be, we couldn't meet all our targets one thing or another, um, it's a good news story. And I think we've led the way in it and something we should be very proud of ourselves for doing. So I'm um, happy to note the plan and performance report. Thank you, Sinead and everybody. Thanks, Sir Irving. Yeah, happy to second Councillor Garrity in that regard. And just one thing that I would highlight, Sometimes our committee and officers come under um, adverse criticism with regard to refusals and the way they actually determine applications. If you look at the statistical information, we're among the highest actually approval. And that is actually down, I think, coupled with the amount of pre-work before applications going in is tied in with the uh, pads, uh, admittedly. There are still agents out there, and you've highlighted it, Mary, that still don't put the proper information in, and we should be uh, kicking ass, so to speak, if you can excuse the language, over YouTube. Uh, but we need to, because they've got to realise we are here to help uh, our constituents, and you as agents are working on behalf of your um, applicants. And you should be doing the best business possible and you should be providing all the information and working in cooperation with our officers and our officers are actually there to help you work within the policies and we as a committee are here to ensure that that happens um, we do not like it when we have to drag you along so please if you're watching take note thank you very much Jim. Okay, members, and uh, I suppose I, I support the comments in support of our um, officers. It has been a difficult year, and, and certainly uh, we get an insight into the work that goes on, but we don't certainly see uh, a, a great percentage of that. But uh, the, the planning systems kept moving forward in, in the most difficult circumstances. I do want to commend and support the words of Councillor Clarity, and, and, and we're all in agreement with that. Okay, members, so. Item 11 then is correspondence. Have any correspondence? Yep. Okay. Sorry, 11.1, sorry, is to consider correspondence dated 14th of July 21 from the Planning Appeals Commission regarding LA 10 2020-1235F. I'll read in gold limited. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so this is um, peace correspondence um, from the, the Planning Appeals Commission um, and it's being brought to the attention of um, members today um, because it's, it's an application that we know that members would want to have sight of the correspondence um, and it's also our intention um, to place the correspondence um, um, before um, the next council meeting as well. So the correspondence advises us that an appeal has been lodged in, res in respect of this section 54 application. Um, and as you'll see, that when we refer to that, it's the ap application by Delray and Gold Limited, um, and it's in respect of the permission seeking to retain um, mining related surface infrastructure um, development without compliance with condition 41 of planning approval K 2014-0246. Um, and this, the application seeks permission to vary condition 41 so as to allow a period of five years from the completion of decommissioning restoration, presently three years from the date of its commencement. 
Um, so the, the correspondence from the PAC is really the first step in their process um, to seek um, a copy of the listed correspondence from us. So whenever we have received this um, appeal correspondence, what it, what it is known as is, is a non-determination appeal. Um, so it's appeal, I suppose, in default of a decision. Um, so where a decision hasn't been taken by the council, um, then the, the applicant, um, the appellant in this case, then can seek a non-determination hearing um, or appeal before um, the Planning Appeals Commission. Um, so that means then that the, the Planning Appeals Commission will now be the decision maker on this particular application. Um, and as with all appeals then, um, you can see there that the, the Planning Appeals are asking us to submit um, the documentation that we have um, on our file to them. Um, and that then allows them to, to continue their process. Um, and as with all appeals, um, the council then will partake um, as a participant in the appeal, um, and we will submit our statement of case and give evidence and partake in the appeal process. Um, and the PAC have published guidance um, on their website in terms of the, the various types of planning appeal um, and the various stages of the, the appeal process and the roles um, of each party in that particular process. Um, so. As I've said, it, it's really just on the on the schedule to bring it um, to your attention and members um, for noting. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It, it, just a small uh, niggly point, but it may be material or otherwise. Um, on their letter on the front cover, um, we're stated as a borough council. We are not a borough council or a district council. So um, I think you should ask them to change that because that could be material if it went further. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. And Councillor Garrity. Thank you, Chair. And I think as Sinead said, this is really just for noting and will be brought to the Council. But I suppose I'm looking, uh, there's a bit in this here. Substantial the information requested in this letter is received by Thursday the 29th. Will one, we be following through on that? Um, is a question because I think our meetings that night, now we have a council have always supported, you know, that this is a decision that's going to be taken by central government or whatever, by the department. And, uh, um, you know, we have to allow due process to take course. We do know there's people who are very passionate about that and rightly so and have every right to be. But are we going to have this information and by then? And are we like the agents who aren't front loading? Have we not done our job right by having it in on time? Thank you, Councillor Gardy. So in terms of the, the information, we're required to have that information um, with the Planning Appeals Commission. So it's really the first step in the appeals process. This is us providing the Planning Appeals Commission with all of the information that we have in terms of the information submitted by the appellant and then any objections or letters, mm -hmm. any letters of representation, um, whether it be in support of or, or objection to the application and any other correspondence we have in files. So for example, um, consultee responses and so on. So we will be required to to get that information within that time frame. Okay. And have we been late in it to date? Um, no, no, we haven't. That's it. Well, no, I'm happy to note the letter and then it's probably brought to council next Thursday. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, uh, that includes all the correspondence. Um, item 12, any other relevant, urgent and relevant business? Nobody is indicating. So with that, I thank you all for your attendance and I thank our uh, officers and council staff for facilitating the meeting here in the Grange in, a, in a, such a glorious, glorious warm day. And uh, I wish you well for the rest of the evening. Peace.